it's 1.30 and we made it. Uh, welcome to the National Research Summit on Care, Services and Support for Persons with Dementia and Their Caregivers. Uh, we're only 108 days later than we expected, but we are on board here. So if I could have uh, the next slide, please. Uh, on behalf of my co-chair, Jennifer Wolf, and myself, I'm Dave Rubin. Uh, we would like to welcome everybody to this uh, fantastic series of, uh, of three sessions uh, of the summit. Next slide. Just to uh, let everyone know, this event has been made possible by the National Institutes on Aging in collaboration with the Foundation for NIH. The organizations listed here have made generous contributions to this event through the Foundation for NIH, including the Alzheimer's Association, which is a lead sponsor. Next slide, please. So the, uh, the introductions will include the purpose in the summit of the structure, the organizations of gaps and opportunities by themes and cross-cutting themes, which I will cover, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Wolf, who will talk about the process for incorporating input in your roles, as well as the summit logistics. Next slide, please. So the uh, primary anticipated outcome of the 2020 summit is the identification of gaps and opportunities for research priorities to inform federal agencies, foundations, and private sector organizations. The summit will also summarize the state of the science, identify gaps in knowledge, and high, highlight progress that has been made and as a since and a result of the 2017 summit. Next slide, please. So uh, as everyone knows, uh, things didn't happen exactly as planned. We had uh, planned and we were in the final stages of preparing for a two-day in-person summary uh, from March 24th to 25th, uh, 2020. But due to COVID-19, uh, we have switched to three virtual sessions. Two will be held in July and one in August. And each of these sessions will be structured similarly with short research presentations around the uh, themes, uh, introduction of draft gap, research gaps and opportunities, reactor panels uh, perspectives, and then a period of moderated questions and answers and discussion. Uh, given time constraints, we are not going to uh, give a lengthy uh, uh, bio about uh, introductions about to the speakers, uh, but these are included in the speakers' bios, which you have a web link to. Uh, at this moment, I would like to actually give a special thanks to uh, the NIA staff, Elena Fazio, uh, Chandra Keller, Courtney Wallen, and Jessica Bowden. Uh, they have truly been a, a dream team. Uh, in getting this project and this uh, conference uh, to fruition. Next slide, please. There will, be, uh, there will be six and a half themes that we will go through. Uh, the first is on the impact of dementia, which we'll hear about today. The second uh, is on long-term services and supports in the home, community, and residential care centers for persons with dementia and their caregivers. The third theme is on services and supports in medical care settings for persons with dementia. And then because themes two and three should not be silos, we have an integration uh, sub-theme, uh, the present and future of integrated long-term care and medical care. Theme four, which we will also cover today, it will be about participation of persons with dementia and their care covers and research. Theme five will be intervention research, dissemination and implementation methods. And finally, theme six will focus on research resources, methods, and data infrastructure. Next slide, please. And there will be uh, five cross-cutting themes that each of the uh, presenters and, uh, and the uh, gaps and opportunities will cover. These include perspectives from persons with dementia and their caregivers, health disparities, ethics, technology, and etiologies. So at this point, I'm gonna 
turn it over to, uh, to Jennifer, who will talk about the process. Great, thank you. A critical element of uh, planning for this summit has been ensuring that we are listening and incorporating the perspectives of people living with dementia and their family members and other care partners at each step in the process. This included publishing a request for information in April of last year, as well as, next slide, assembling a steering committee with diverse expertise including individuals who are living with dementia and uh, caregivers and care partners, uh, uh, federal stakeholders, uh, co-chair of the 2017 Summit on Dementia Care and Services, as well as uh, theme co-leaders for each of the six themes that David uh, previously uh, introduced. Um, here, we purposefully matched uh, one academic researcher with a leader um, in expertise in policy or practice, recognizing the importance of um, the real world experience in developing a research agenda for dementia care and services. Next slide. Uh, re, uh, uh, a critical piece of um, in, uh, incorporating the perspectives of um, diverse stakeholders included coordinating the input of five stakeholder groups that were convened by the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation um, of HHS. Next slide. These five stakeholder groups encompassed persons living with dementia, family caregivers and care partners of those living with dementia, service providers, workforce development, and payers. Each of these groups meant multiple times over many months and produced uh, draft gaps and opportunities that were provided uh, for consideration by the steering committee. I wanna note here the important leadership of Katie Maslow, who coordinated um, uh, the work of all of the stakeholder groups, um, as well as the valuable input of the co-chairs of the other committee members um, that inform the gaps and opportunities that are being presented um, at each of the um, virtual meetings. Next slide. Uh, reiterating the emphasis of incorporating diverse perspectives, we, uh, the steering committee sought the input from federal partners, the National Alzheimer's Project Act Advisory Council, um, and importantly, we uh, elicited and continue to look for input from the public um, to provide uh, uh, input into the draft gaps and opportunities, um, as well as uh, uh, questions and comments um, before, during, and after each of the three virtual meetings um, this summer. Next slide. I wanna pause and say a few words about the gaps and opportunities, um, recognizing that these are um, a critically important outcome of the summit. They are um, meant to be broad and to encompass targeted areas for which new and impactful knowledge could lead to efforts that would meaningfully impact the lives of persons with dementia and their family caregivers. Here, I wanna note that the absence of a topic does not mean that it is not important. Um, additionally, although the the gaps and opportunities are being presented um, uh, within each of the six themes. These topics um, are overlapping and are meant to encompass a broad body of work. So a topic that does not appear in one session may, may appear elsewhere. Next slide. Uh, we invite your participation in the summit in several ways. We have devoted 15 minutes of questions and answers with the theme co-chairs, presenters, and panelists and um, we welcome your comments and questions using the Zoom Q&A function during each of the meetings. Um, although it is possible that time will not permit all questions to be discussed, um, all of your questions and comments will be provided to the theme co-chairs and will inform revisions to our gaps and opportunities. Similarly, either during or after the session, you may respond online to the request for information. The link is presented here on the slide um, to prov uh, provide feedback on refinements or suggest new gaps and opportunities. Next slide. Um, our agenda for today involves three items, um, setting the stage for the overall summit, followed by um, themes one and four, focusing on the impact of dementia and the participation of persons with dementia and their caregivers and care partners in research. Um, to set the stage, uh, we will hear first from uh, several speakers, Dr. Richard Hodes, Director of the National Institute on Aging, 
two of our steering committee members, Dr. Lonnie Schiffer and Katie Brandt, who will share their perspectives um, and insight um, relating to the lived experience of um, uh, persons with dementia and their family members. And finally, Arnie Owens, whose office at the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation has a key role in coordinating the National Alzheimer's Project Act. Um, and then we'll pause and hear from our final presenter. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Hodes. Each of these four presenters will have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, David. And thank you for all who've uh, contributed so much to make this happen. The next slide, please. I want to give recognition to the fact that we're holding this remotely uh, due to the effects of the pandemic, which have itself pointed out disparities in areas that are critical to the theme of the summit. Now, first, the fact that uh, COVID-19 has been proportionate, disproportionately affecting older adults uh, is quite relevant to the theme of the meeting, which also stresses a number of syndromes and disorders which have predominant impact on older men and women, though not exclusively. And in addition, I have pointed out a, a disproportionate effect of COVID-19, as well as so many of our health challenges on underrepresented, underserved populations. So I'd like to commit the purpose of the meeting as well to the promotion of health, elimination of disparities, and looking for health equities. Now, next slide, please. This is meant to just illustrate the remarkable increase in resources we have in the form of congressional appropriations over past years, which have allowed us to move forward as well as we have and give us the ability to act upon the input that we get at this summit and make a real difference. You can see that starting with 2016 and through the present, remarkable increases year over year, including this year's $350 million increase in appropriations. If we look at the next slide, for what this has meant for the total funding for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias research, I point just to the box in red to the right, which illustrates the fold increase between 2015 and 2019, approximately a fourfold increase. And note that it has resulted in a similar increase across Alzheimer's and each of the related dementias that are a part of the, the summit's theme. Next slide, please. Next, uh, the status of an undertaking that was commissioned involving both the ARC and the National Academies to look at the state of information on dementia and caregiving research to help guide us towards those gaps and priorities which come forward. So the AHRQ draft report was released on March 24th, and I suspect that many of you had an opportunity to participate in that release. The next slide shows that the next phase, which will be undertaken by the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, had its first public workshop in April and now will reconvene to draft their own report, which is expected to be released in early 2021. And this, together with the outcome of this current summit, is going to inform very much the future of research in these areas. Next slide. Other activities that are being supported, uh, NASA also a decadal survey of behavior and social science research on AD and ADRD, also very much relevant to the themes of this summit. Next. Uh, data sharing, which has long been an important uh, aspect and, and a value uh, and uh, an attribute, I would say, of research in AD and ADRD, has led NIA to try to do its best to put all of these resources on a single data sharing landing page. And I simply point that out to you here. Next slide. The se semi-postal uh, Alzheimer's stamp uh, was an interesting project that was congressionally mandated. It's brought in over a million dollars. And I mention it because what we've done is to try to pay tribute to the thousands of people who purchased stamps and contributed to this by using these funds, in fact, to support these summits. So it's a very visible contribution of the many, many people who expressed their concern about Alzheimer's related dementias through purchase of these semi-postal stamps. Next slide. The history of AD, ADRD summits illustrated here. So the AD summits have occurred in 2012, 15, 18, in 2021, we have the next schedule, which we already have committed to be virtual in recognition of the likely trajectory of the pandemic. The Alzheimer's Disease Related Dementia Summits, 2013, 16, 19, and we'll see where we are in 2020 about where it will be held. And the Care and Services Summit, which, as was noted, first held in 2017 and now 2020. Next slide. So we invite you to uh, share your perspectives. Uh, on care and services through the virtual meeting series that we are in the midst of now or initiating. Next slide. And uh, with that, I thank you from NIA's perspective for what all of you have done 
and commit ourselves here at NIA to act upon what you point us to in best serving research in support of caregiver issues, those who are being uh, cared for, uh, the, the current and potentially future individuals who will profit from what all of you will teach us at this summit. Thank you. Good afternoon. In 2014, I was finally in my dream job, but after only two and a half years of teaching and running a busy health administration program, I noticed that something was off. Assignments lost, not understanding my notes, failing to make meetings, all in my mind anyway, attributable to being busy. I thought no one noticed. So I felt I was getting by with my minor failings when suddenly I was approached by a group of students. They were concerned that I had missed classes without explanation, failed to return assignments, seemingly disorganized in the classroom. So just as abruptly as my new life began, so it ended. But what came next was a nightmare of misdiagnosis, shame, reluctance, and skepticism from physicians who I felt um, who felt that I, at 59 years old, was too young, too together, too smart, too articulate, because after all, I could do serial sevens, put pegs in holes, and name all of the Great Lakes. And thus, it was stress, depression, anxiety, everything but dementia. I was made to feel that I was making it up, that I wanted, and one physician actually said this, something to be wrong with me. Maybe just a little exaggeration, she said. She was so condescending because I knew it was real. Others saw it, others told you, I told you. I know you cannot fix it, but please acknowledge it and support me. Finally, I found a physician who acknowledged that there was a problem. It was so refreshing, I felt like I wasn't crazy until he said, do you really wanna be saddled with this diagnosis? Do you really want to stop driving? Do you want to be in a long-term facility? Have others look at you differently? I turned and said to my son, I'm done. I don't need a diagnosis to know that there's something wrong with me. But you need one to get the care you need. You've used all of your resources. We have put so much time into useless exams and testing and emotional torture. And all of this was said in front of that physician who shrugged and said, hey, I get it. I have these conversations every day. Now take this paper to the front desk and I'll see you in six months. You won't, I said, and we left. Ultimately, we discovered that none of these physicians had actually taken the time to even peruse the other notes that I brought with me from the multiple previous physician visits and testing. There was no communication. Instead of reviewing previous testing, there was just new testing with apparently no need to look at other notes and more apparently no use for comparative data. I was emotionally broken and financially destroyed because I could not work and in 18 months between medical care and living expenses, I used up what savings I had. I had planned to work forever. What purpose would a hearty savings have had in my life? People who are newly diagnosed need to be told about the financial toll that this disease will take, about the need for communication at every level between physicians, caregivers, the patient, family, and friends. There must be more robust discussions and review of previous data and documentation. More listening and less judgment. Physicians need to learn how to communicate with the patients at the earliest stages. They need to believe them and trust that their judgment um, is correct, that something is off. And they need to understand the danger to the patient of failure to plan for what might come next. I am a college professor who can no longer clearly understand the meaning of what I read, who cannot count change or do simple math or follow complex directions. Life is different. I am different, but I am different from others who are different. So my question to you is, how will you include us and support us despite these differences without shaming us for having them? Thank you.
Thank you, Lonnie. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Brandt. I'm very happy to be with all of you through this virtual platform. While I wear multiple professional hats in our ADRD community, today I'm here to share my voice as a family caregiver. Next slide. Can you please advance for the three photos? Thank you. My journey to this podium began with a love story. My husband, Mike, and I were married a few months after college and armed with entry-level jobs in human services and a hand-me-down Buick, we started our lives together. It was during my pregnancy with our son, Noah, that Mike began experiencing changes in behavior and executive function that led us to a multitude of appointments and tests that ultimately led to a diagnosis of behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia at the age of 29. Just four days after Mike's diagnosis, my mother passed away unexpectedly, and just 17 days later, when my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at the age of 59. Next slide, please. Well, at the age of 29, I found myself caring for two adult men with progressive dementias and my infant son. I left my career in the child welfare industry, lost our home to foreclosure, and spent every dime of our retirement savings in the process of realigning life in the new normal. I realized that Mike's young age presented barriers to accessing services, and dad's status as a veteran opened doors for him. As unique as my situation was, I learned that I also had many things in common with other families living with dementia at every age and stage. The need for respite, education, community connections, and specialized providers were universal. Next slide, please. We know that a multidisciplinary approach to care can be helpful and that all care does not happen in clinic. We can coach individuals and families on the process of care planning by connecting them with a trifecta of community-based care. This can begin with a connection to an expert medical provider who can help to navigate diagnosis, symptom management, and prognostication to help anticipate future needs. A connection with a disease-specific community, the Alzheimer's Association, the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration, and the Lewy Body Dementia Association, amongst others, can help build a network of families walking the same journey who can share resources and support. Community connections can lay the foundation for resources that include adult day health, memory care, and hospice services. At each stage of care planning, disease state and symptoms can drive decisions. And special considerations may be given for families living with young onset dementia while navigating parenting, work, and care. Next slide, please. As we acknowledge unique situations, it's an opportunity to recognize the values, culture, and goals of care for each individual and family. Diversity of racial and ethnic background, LGBTQ+, socioeconomic status, and even relationships with loved ones may all be drivers in establishing care plans that embrace dignity and personhood at every stage and has the potential to evolve over time. Despite dementia, dementia's looming presence, we learned how to be a family. We made new memories of joy. And that's because we had the support of a care team that was able to pivot as goals of care and priorities shifted over time. Next slide, please. And yes, thank you. Mike passed away on April 19th, 2012 at the age of 33, just three years after his diagnosis, 21 days after our son Noah turned four, and only months before we might have celebrated a decade of marriage. Mike lost the ability to speak, walk, and swallow, but he never lost his voice. As Mike's wife, I was his biggest advocate, and I continue this advocacy today in honor of Mike and on behalf of families everywhere living with dementia in their lives. Next slide, please. I am honored to sit as co-chair of the Napa Advisory Council uh, with Dr. Alan Levy. I think that the message of shared leadership between a family caregiver and a clinician sends a powerful message about Napa's acknowledgement of the need for diverse and authentic voices in this space. Next slide, please. Well, it certainly takes a village. Thank you to everyone who helped us along our journey. For those of you in the audience who've dedicated your professional lives to this community, I thank you for the work that you do every day. For those of you walking this journey, I'm sending support and love your way. 
I look forward to the opportunity to continue to be an advocate and a professional when the, within the ADRD community, fueled by the hope that the cure of tomorrow is not so far from the care of today. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide a few comments on the commitment of HHS and the administration uh, to addressing Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And uh, thank you, Katie and Lonnie, for, for sharing your experiences. My name is Arnie Owens. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Disability, Aging, and Long-Term Care Policy uh, within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, or ASPE, as we call it. Uh, ASPE is the Secretary of HHS's uh, Policy Planning and Research Shop that helps inform policy decisions in HHS. We also lead various cross-cutting initiatives and coordinate across, coordinate across HHS on a range of priority issues. Since 2011, we've also been the leading, or we've been leading the implementation of the National Alzheimer's Project Act. The next slide, please. The National Alzheimer's Project Act, or NAPA, created an opportunity for the federal government to start addressing Alzheimer's disease and related dementias in a coordinated matter. Uh, many of you uh, are probably familiar with the NAPA legislation. It's small but mighty, only three and a half pages, but it has had a profound impact on how HHS thinks about and addresses dementia. The NAPA legislation asks the secretary with, among other things, uh, creating and maintaining an integrated national plan to overcome Alzheimer's, uh, coordinating research and services across all federal agencies, and creating an advisory council uh, to review and comment on the national plan and its implementation. I'll describe the national plan and the advisory council to just give you some context for what the discussion today and in the next two sessions uh, will inform. Next slide, please. In 2012, HHS released the first national plan to address Alzheimer's disease. It has five ambitious goals that you see here, and for each, there are strategies and specific steps that HHS and our federal partners are taking to meet these goals. The national plan is updated every year. Uh, it's been an important framing document for strategizing uh, about how to meet the needs of this population uh, and their caregivers. Next slide, please. In order to inform the work of the government and the national plan updates, uh, ASPE convenes the Advisory Council on Alzheimer's Research, Care, and Services. It includes 12 non-federal members from different perspectives, as well as representatives from these HHS agencies and other departments. Katie Brandt, who we just heard from, is one of the current co-chairs of the Advisory Council. And uh, Laura Gitlin, who, who will be speaking uh, right after me, is a former chair. Uh, Helen Lamine of our office is the, is the BFO. It's rare for a federal advisory council to have a federal representative as uh, full members. But on the Napa Council, uh, this has led to more buy-in from federal agencies and greater collaboration between both federal and non-federal partners. The Advisory Council meets quarterly. Uh, it makes annual recommendations to the Secretary and the Congress uh, about how to address Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Uh, that is all very important. The next meeting is on Monday, July 20th. And that is the meeting where the Advisory Council uh, will adopt the 2020 uh, recommendations. Next slide, please. That brings us here today to the second National Research Summit uh, on care services and supports uh, for persons with dementia and their caregivers, the result of a persistent recommendation of the Advisory Council, by the way. The summit's a great opportunity to improve the care of people with dementia and their caregivers uh, by identifying research gaps and opportunities to improve and expand research. The result of this summit will inform the research funded by the NIH and the NIA, as well as the recommendations 
uh, the advisory council makes this year. At HHS, we see this as an opportunity to take advantage of the great thinking of the best minds in the field, uh, specifically all of you who have worked on this summit over the last year and who are joining online here today. We're just glad you're with us. Next slide, please. In closing, just let me thank you. Thank you to our colleague, colleagues at the uh, National Institute on Aging for pulling together uh, this important meeting and for reformatting it for the pandemic. Uh, sorry that this has happened this way, but that's the reality we're all dealing with. Uh, and thank you to all the experts, advocates, stakeholders, and most importantly, people with dementia and their caregivers who are joining uh, this summit here today. Uh, we're committed to addressing these conditions uh, and we look forward to your input on how to more effectively do so over the three uh, summit meetings to come. Again, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. And with that, we're going to transition uh, to uh, progress since the first summit. And who better to do that than Laura Gitlin, who is the co-chair of the uh, first summit. So uh, Laura, it's, it's yours. Wonderful, thank you so much and welcome. I have the honor and privilege to briefly highlight the progress that was made from the first historic National Research Summit on Care and Services. Next slide, please. Just want to acknowledge my funding agencies that have supported my research and specifically the National Institute on Aging and I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. Next slide, please. The very first research summit on care and services in dementia was held October 16th and 17th of 2017, which is just under three years ago. As the first summit, it had a very a critical goal of identifying what we know, what we do not know, and what we need to know in order to advance comprehensive dementia care that improves the daily lives of people living with dementia and their care partners. Important themes of that summit and carried forward to the summit today is that we need to embrace complexity and diversity. We need to recognize that one size does not fit all, and we need to understand the lived experience and dementia care needs in the larger context of race, ethnicity, gender, age of onset, etiologies, disease stages, living care arrangements, geography, financial status, and their intersectionality. Next slide, please. I believe it is safe to say that we learned a lot from putting on the first summit and since then in only 33 months. Foremost is that this first summit ushered in an important paradigm switch. It is now fully recognized that care is important, that there is a science to care, that care may be able to address clinical symptoms and even slow disease progression. Whereas before the summit, this was not necessarily uniformly recognized or appreciated. Also, there is now wide recognition that we do have evidence that is useful. This alone signals the important progress made from the first summit. The summit also ushered in a paradigm switch as it concerns how we conduct research and demonstrated the critical importance of involving people living with dementia and care partners and other stakeholders in the research process and how doing so changes our research questions, aligns our measurement with what matters to end users and pushes us to develop methodologies for engaging all individuals who may face various challenges by traditional research modalities. Next slide, please. The first summit generated 464 unique recommendations, which were categorized into these 12 buckets. And I will highlight the National Institute on Aging response to this first summit, and specifically three initiatives that are very exciting. But it's notable that the summit spurred many other initiatives by many other funders, such as the Alzheimer's Association. Next slide, please. Since October, 2017 summit, NIA has issued 26 funding opportunities targeting, as you see, various aspects of dementia care and which address specific recommendations within the 12 buckets. This is truly an extraordinary number of funding opportunities, again, in only 33 months. It takes a very long time to issue a funding opportunity and to make awards. Next slide, please. 
As of June 2020, approximately 129 new NIA awards have been made, with many more in progress, thus accelerating the pace of science of care, and again, only in 33 months. In addition to investigator-initiated awards, NIA has also issued critical RFAs, many of which are in progress, and awards will be made sometime this year. Next slide, please. I would like to highlight three recently funded initiatives addressing many of the themes, recommendations, and the lessons we learned from the first summit. We learned a very critical lesson from the first summit, and that is that our measures tend to be deficit-based, draw upon a limited number of theoretical frameworks, reflect the dominant cultural values with its emphasis on deficit and individual responsibility, and do not address what matters most to stakeholders, including people living with dementia, their care partners, healthcare organizations. And in response, NIA funded Link AD, led by doctors Fazio and Zimmerman, and members of the Alzheimer's Association, with guidance from 38 research steering committee members with global representation and a care and support advisory group to critique existing outcome measures, promote development of new outcome measures, and facilitate their dissemination, adoption, and their implementation in real world settings. Next slide, please. To illustrate how critical their work is, I show here what's called a heat map that we have developed as part of the NIA Impact Collaboratory that maps the distribution of outcome measures that have previously been used in 54 published efficacy studies that show benefit in, to caregivers that are testing caregiver interventions. But a quick glance shows that the overwhelming number of outcomes are deficit oriented and focused on areas of mental health. While very important, of course, missing are domains identified in the first summit as important to consider, such as stigma, adaptation, style, skills, resilience. And so link in, next slide please, will promote measures that foster a constructive balance between strength and deficit assessments and consider measures that are important from different stakeholders. Next slide please. The second critical initiative is the NIA Impact Collaboratory, awarded in 2019 to Dr. Moore and Dr. Mitchell, and involving over 60 scientists across the United States. Impact addresses a significant gap identified in the first summit in intervention research, and that is the lack of systematic testing of evidence in real world healthcare settings for their eventual dissemination and wide scale implementation. You can see from that something, it disappeared, but you, yes, thank you. You can see from the uh, circular uh, organizational chart, this diagram highlights the structure of the collaboratory and how it includes many different types of stakeholders who come together to identify ways of moving forward in a pragmatic way. Next slide, please. The third critical initiative involves technology. The improving care for people with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias using technology, eye care, AD, ADRD, is a challenge of the, which afforded the Eureka Prize competition in which NIA rewards and spurs development of solutions or use of technology-based solutions to improve dementia care. And I encourage you to look online for these win winners who receive funds to continue and advance their very exciting work. Next slide, please. Also, NIA is investing in investigator-initiated research, and I share here, and could you just click all the pictures? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this is investigator-initiated research that my colleagues, uh, Dr. Kales and Dr. Lykezos, are working on a very exciting uh, online platform called the We Care Advisor that will be tested with a national survey, national sample that provides knowledge and skills and specific strategies for families to help manage challenging behavioral and psychological symptoms. In a pilot study, we found that uh, using the We Care Advisor decreased stress, improved confidence, and there was a trend towards a reduction in the severity and frequency of behavioral symptoms. Next slide. So, to summarize, within 33 months, NIA produced an impressive array of initiatives and awards with more forthcoming. 
Science of care and services is at an important critical inflection point. In the next three years, their promises to yield, these new awards promise to yield very important new understandings of lived experiences, testing of novel care approaches for diverse populations and settings, and the integration of evidence in different healthcare systems. While intervention development is slow, new iterative models, technology, implementation science, and pragmatic trial designs hold the promise of accelerating the use of the evidence in everyday care settings, whether that be medical, social. We have a lot of work ahead, but with the recognition of the importance of involving stakeholders and the evidence of how to do that effectively, I truly believe our future is very promising. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and now for what everybody has been waiting for uh, is the first of our themes, uh, theme one, impact of dementia. Uh, the the co-leaders have been uh, Maria Aranda and Ian Kramer. So I'm gonna turn it over to you folks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maria Aranda. I'm a social worker and faculty member of the Suzanne Dorit Peck School of Social Work and executive director of the Institute on Aging from the Roy Ball Institute on Aging at the University of Southern California. It's my distinct honor to serve as co-chair of theme one. I would like to introduce uh, Ian Kremer, who will pro provide um, information regarding theme one. Ian? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Maria said, I'm Ian Kremer, executive director of the LEAD Coalition and co-chair of theme one, Impact of Dementia. If we could have the next slide, please. And this is our theme. Uh, this theme includes issues related to heterogeneity and trends in the lived experience of dementia, including the clinical impact and trajectory for people living with dementia and their family caregivers across the range of etiologies, the economic impact of dementia for patients, caregivers, payers, public programs, and society, and the effects of dementia, including the impact of health disparities on diverse populations, for example, by sex and gender, socioeconomic status, geography, race and ethnicity, language, education, living arrangements, including people living alone or without caregivers. As you can already surmise, theme one encompasses a wide variety of topics and issues, but the ongoing thread that emerges is heterogeneity and the lived experience of dementia. Although we'll present on a variety of topics such as the epidemiology of dementia, disparities in health and healthcare delivery, and the economic impact of dementia, we acknowledge that this is not a monolithic phenomena, but encompasses diverse conditions, diverse peoples, diverse social, economic, and health impacts based on lived lives and the institutions that influence health and well being. It's my pleasure to introduce our three esteemed speakers. I'll introduce the, all speakers first before we transition to the first presentation. Dr. Rachel Whitmer is Professor of Public Health Sciences and Chief of, of the Division of Epidemiology at the University of California, Davis. Our second speaker, Dr. Ladson Hinton, is Professor and Geriatric Psychiatrist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of California, Davis. Rounding out our presentations is Dr. Ju Julie Zizimopoulos. She is associate professor at the Sol Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. Dr. Whitmer, please begin. Good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening for everyone around the globe. I'm thrilled to be here to talk about population trends in Alzheimer's disease and related dementia, the importance of life course and diversity. Next slide, please. I have no disclosures associated with this presentation. I do receive funding from the National Institute on Aging and the Alzheimer's Association. Next slide, please. We have several key themes and I hope that you come away with even two or three of these after the end of this presentation. Um, the first is that epidemiological patterns in rates of Alzheimer's disease and associated dementias are different across different racial ethnic groups, but we still have a long ways to go. There are still key groups that are missing from population-based research on dementia. 
There are marked differences in rates of dementia, as well as risk factors for dementia across these different racial ethnic groups. Risk factors operate differently at different time points in different populations. And a life course approach to population-based research in dementia is essential if we wanna change differences in rates of dementia and how to give best dementia care. And finally, harmonization of data and the appropriate methods toolbox is essential. Next slide, please. So why do we care about, about trends? Why do we care about counting the number of dementia cases in different populations? Well, if we study the analysis of the distribution of rates of dementia across different groups, this can give us clues to understanding how and why this happens and what we can do to make changes in the large differences that we do see in rates of dementia. Next slide, please. Why is diversity so critical in population-based studies of Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Well, the U.S. population is becoming increasingly diverse, and we're going to become even more diverse. And as you can see from this chart, we're going to see a large increase in non-whites, particularly in those of Hispanic origin, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Black and African American. And we're gonna have a lot more of these individuals, not only in our, our population overall, but particularly in the elderly segment of our population. Next slide, please. It is critical then as researchers and as, as scientists that we do our best job and our best effort to recruit diversity into our studies and try to not only have studies that are emblematic of the current US population, but also studies that represent the future of the US population. Next slide, please. This is a study done by Dr. Elizabeth Rose Maeda, who is faculty at UCLA. And she leveraged data from 300,000 health plan members of Kaiser Permanente Northern California, which is an integrated healthcare delivery system. And she looked at incidents, which is rates of new cases of dementia over 14 years in six different racial ethnic groups. And as you can see here, our Black African Americans have the highest incidence, followed by our American Indian and Alaskan Natives, and our Asian Americans have the lowest incidence. Next slide, please. She also conducted a study looking at racial ethnic patterns in rates of dementia among those all with type 2 diabetes. So even in the context of a chronic disease, we still see racial ethnic patterns and differences in rates of dementia. Next slide, please. So why does it matter if rates of Alzheimer's disease and associated dementia are different in different populations? Well, there's a few key things from the 2016 Maeda study that really set it apart. First off, the magnitude of the difference was smaller than what we had seen in other studies, particularly when we were comparing the rates of dementia for Black African Americans compared to whites. And a lot of this has to do with the source of the population that one uses for their studies. Prior studies have been mostly recruiting from memory clinics. This is a community-based sample with equal access to healthcare. This was also the first look at American Indians and Asian Americans. And it's a little bit Interesting to step back and think the study was published in 2016 and up until that date, there had not been a study that had looked at the epidemiology and the rates of dementia in Asian Americans and American Indians. The rate was much lower in Asian Americans and to give you an idea of the public health impact, if we were to lower rates of dementia in the US to the rates that were seen in this study in Asian Americans, you would prevent 190,000 cases of dementia annually. Now this study doesn't tell us why these differences are there, but it gives us clues of where to look more closely. Next slide, please. So heterogeneity in population studies is absolutely critical and key if we wanna solve differences in rates of dementia and help with dementia care. And this is something that is constantly seen is that we have a balance. And as researchers, we know that the longer that our research interview is, the more samples that, that we take from people, the less representative that study becomes. When you're studying humans, you get a healthy volunteer effect. And even though there's no one right answer to this, keeping this in mind as we do our studies is absolutely key if we wanna make differences. Next slide, please. So um, next slide again, thank you. So 
Here, we have some clues from studies from the Framingham Heart Study and also studies from the United Kingdom that possibly we're seeing a lowered rate of incidence, which is rate of new cases of dementia over time due to higher levels of education and better screening and treatment of cardiovascular risk factors. And I think this is essential and key to understand because this gives us some hints of how can we change dementia going forward. Of course, the anticipated prevalence of dementia is still going to go up as we have more people living longer than ever before, but it's very compelling to understand that possibly better treatment of cardiovascular risk factors and higher education can lower incidence. Next slide, please. So who we study and how we, we study them matters. And we know in our lower middle income um, countries who are going through an epidemiologic transition where infectious disease is no longer the primary driver of death. And we know that in these countries, people are expected to be living longer and to be experiencing more chronic disease. And a lot of these chronic diseases are the primary risk factors for dementia. And so understanding aging and different mortality rates in different racial ethnic groups and different populations can poise us to best understand, best treat, best screen, and best help those who are caring for those with dementia. Next slide, please. I wanna take a step back and remind everyone that social determinants of health and health disparities is multifaceted. We can't just fix one thing to make a difference. And so we know that we need changes in medical care and access, social and economic factors, the physical environment, the built environment, and health behaviors. And these things all work in concert to affect the disparities that we see in rates of dementia. Next slide, please. This is an example work by Dr. Paula gil Sanz, Social Context and Race. Being born in a state with a high stroke mortality rate puts you at greatly higher risk of dementia, whether you are black or white. And the participants in this study were all living in Northern California by the 1960s, but being born in one of these states puts you at higher risk. Next slide, please. Here you see the cumulative incidence of dementia for those born in a stroke belt and those born out of a stroke belt. But what's key here is that being born in a state with a high stroke mortality rate was 9.6 times more common for the black participants of the study versus the whites. So if we wanna make a change in rates of dementia and disparities in risk factors for dementia, we have to understand there are systematic large level differences in exposures to health risk factors for dementia. Next slide. So is it enough to just make studies more diverse? So we know that these disparities represent systematic differences in health between different populations that come from social determinants of, of health. So yes, we need to make studies more diverse, but that's not enough. We need to ask the right questions. We need to ask questions that have meaning and context. We need to use the correct methods and we need to contextualize the research. How can we make research on dementia and dementia caregiving more accessible for those with low levels of formal education, those who may not speak English as a primary language? And how can we extend studies to people who don't have opportunities to receive formal education and understand how things like life experience and occupational complexity can help the brain? Next slide, please. This is an example. It's well known that midlife hypertension, high blood pressure is associated with high risk of dementia, but certain groups are much more likely to get hypertension in midlife and die from it. Therefore, they can't even live long enough to be diagnosed with dementia. How can we understand how these risk factors and rates of death differ across different racial groups? And how does that affect our findings today on differences in rates of dementia? Next slide, please. Cumulative advantage and disadvantage happens over the life course. It's public policy, community, interpersonal, and individual. And when we're thinking about dementia and brain health, it, it might become manifest in late life for some people, but it is a reflection of a lifetime of health and processes. Next slide. How do we move the needle? We need diverse populations globally and naturally. Contextualize research. We need a life course approach. We need to pool studies to answer unique questions. We need to harmonize data and we need to use the right methods. Next slide. Thank you very much for your time. I think we'll be moving now to speaker two. Uh, thank you, Dr. Whitmer and uh, hello everyone. Um, so my talk actually will very much build upon Dr. Whitmer's talk 
Uh, I'm going to be talking about disparities in health, services, and interventions for people living with dementia and also family caregivers. Next slide. Uh, these are my disclosures. I have funding from the National Institute on Aging, as well as the National Institute of Mental Health, the Archstone Foundation, and the Alzheimer's Association. Next slide. So these are the takeaway points from the talk, my brief talk today. First, I hope to convince you that there's growing evidence of disparities in dementia diagnosis, treatment, end-of-life care, particularly for African Americans and Latinx uh, people living with dementia. In addition, there's accumulating evidence of disproportionate caregiving impacts, both psychological and economic, for certain groups, and in particular, for certain racial and ethnic minorities, as well as people of lower socioeconomic status. However, the evidence on impacts and care disparities is almost non-existent for many vulnerable populations. We also have an acute evidence gap for efficacy of non-pharmacologic interventions in disparities populations. Next slide. So just some background on why this is, I think, a very important topic. Uh, first, I think we'd all agree that ensuring that services, supports, and interventions are accessible and effective for all segments of our population is essential for what we call health equity. Racial and ethnic minorities, people of lower socioeconomic status, gender and sexual minorities, and rural populations have historically experienced greater challenges accessing and receiving services. And we sometimes refer to these populations as disparities populations. Detecting, understanding, and reducing disparities is critical to public health, but I would argue can also enrich our science and understanding of mechanisms. This presentation will focus primarily on racial and ethnic minorities and to some extent on people with low uh, socioeconomic status. And that's because for many of the disparities populations, there's relatively little evidence. Next slide. So as Dr. Whitmer uh, highlighted, you know, we have a diverse older adult population. 23% of, um, of adults age 65 and above are of ethnic, uh, racial and ethnic minority groups. 30% live at or near the poverty line. One in five persons age 50 and above identifies as LGBTQ. About 20% of older adults live in rural areas and 26% live alone. Next slide. As Dr. Whitmer mentioned, uh, social determinants of health are incredibly important. These can be broadly defined as aspects of the environment in which people are born, grow up, live, work, and age, as well as the systems put in place to deal with illness and support services. These contextual factors shape experiences of illness and caregiving in often very profound ways. Disparities populations are more likely to experience adversity in these broad domains, which include economic well-being and stability, neighborhood and community characteristics and livability, and the nature of local health care and, and social service uh, agencies and systems. Adversity and social determinants of health have the potential to contribute to inequities and disparities in dementia and caregiving. Next slide. This is a very, um, I think, nice overview of disparities research. This is from an article published by Kilborn and colleagues in the American Journal of Public Health in 2006. And basically it says that a disparities research agenda kind of moves from first detecting of the disparities, then trying to understand the mechanisms and determinants, and then building on that to actually introduce interventions that hopefully uh, reduce or eliminate those disparities. Next. So I'm going to move on now to talk about the existing evidence for dementia care disparities for people living with dementia. Next, next slide. So the, in this slide, um, this is a, this, this, there's a lot of information here. I think the, the upshot is that there's growing evidence of disparities along pathways of healthcare from the time of initial assessment and diagnosis to the end of life. Most of our evidence, most of our evidence is based on Black and Latinx persons living with dementia, with very little evidence for other vulnerable populations. At the initial stage of diagnosis, and referral, there's now a body of evidence for increased rates of misdiagnosis and de decreased referral to specialists. 
and we heard earlier on from one of the, the one of the presentations about how critical that first stage of, of uh, initial diagnosis uh, is. After initial diagnosis, multiple studies have found that Black and Latinx persons with dementia are less likely to be prescribed and more likely to discontinue anti-dementia medications. There's also some emerging evidence for increased use of, of antipsychotics, specifically for Latinx people with dementia, and also higher hospital mortality and higher costs of care. Finally, we know that Latinx, Latinx and Black uh, people living with dementia are more likely to reside in under-resourced nursing homes, which have been associated with higher COVID-related deaths. There's also evidence for less likelihood of advanced care planning, more aggressive and costly care at the end of life. But much more research is necessary to understand to what extent these differences that I've described are driven by unequal access and lower quality of care, for example, versus patient preferences, or even in some instances, clinical appropriateness. Enormous gaps also remain in terms of uh, things such as access to evidence-based non-pharmacologic treatments for behavioral problems in healthcare systems and long-term supports and services. Next slide. These are some of the references for what I've just discussed. Next. I'd like to move on now to talk about family caregiving impacts and interventions. Next slide. So what we do know is that there's accumulating evidence that family caregiving impacts are disproportionately experienced by minority families. Data, for example, from the Health and Retirement Survey study has demonstrated that Black and Latinx families provide higher intensity of informal care for a longer duration. There's also, there, there's also evidence that Black and Latinx families provide care to persons living with dementia who are experiencing higher levels of neuropsychiatric and behavioral symptoms. And this is very important because those, those symptoms can be associated, cause a lot of difficulties um, and can be associated with higher levels of caregiver distress, burden, and depression. Caregiver distress has been shown to be higher in Latinx uh, family caregivers compared with uh, white non-Hispanic caregivers. But interestingly, for African-American caregivers, some of the uh, studies actually show the reverse, that African-American American caregivers express a psychological distress at lower levels. And I think this is an important area for research. Another study from the Health and Retirement Study found a higher out-of-pocket costs as a proportion of wealth for Black, lower educated, and single women. That study did not analyze economic impact on Latinx families. Next. So in terms of, of caregiver support uh, interventions, these have been mentioned, and there's, there's a substantial evidence base for the efficacy of family caregiver support interventions. However, that evidence base is very uneven with underrepresentation of disparities populations and underreporting of results by race and ethnicity. In a very important 2018 review of 48 studies funded by NIH, Gilmore, uh, Biofsky, and colleagues found that nearly two thirds of the studies did not report by race and their results by race and ethnicity. Among those studies that did, nearly 80% found significant differences across racial, racial and ethnic groups. One implication for this lack of evidence uh, for disparities populations is that when trials move from efficacy to pragmatic trials, the evidence base is often not adequate uh, for these populations, creating challenges for researchers. So we're still in the early stages of understanding how best to adapt care support interventions to the now well-documented documented differences in cultural values and meanings across racial and ethnic groups. Next slide. So just to summarize, these are some of the critical knowledge gaps. I've touched on a number of these already. Uh, the first is that we need to examine and detect potential disparities in a broader range of vulnerable populations, other race, racial and ethnic populations, gender and sexual minorities, people living in rural areas. Where, where there is substantial evidence, we need to move from detection of disparities to understanding the underlying mechanisms and determinants, and then to actually uh, reduce those disparities, again, where strong evidence exists. 
Uh, as Dr. Whitmer highlighted, and I think that I've found in my review of the field, there's really a, a need to better examine the role of social determinants of health as it impacts family caregivers, people living with dementia, and also as it affects the, the efficacy uh, or effectiveness of interventions. And finally, um, we need to advance the science of intervention adaptation to cultural context and values and also to include a greater range of disparities populations in non-pharmacologic intervention trials. Next slide. These are key references. Next slide. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the economic impact of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias for individuals their care partners and society. Next slide, please. I acknowledge and thank the National Institutes on Aging for support of my research. Next, please. So jumping right in, among persons living with Alzheimer's dementia, the annual per person healthcare costs and the value of the time of family care persons are over $81,000. The value of family caregiving is about 40% of this total. These estimates value an hour of time as equal to the average hourly wage rate of paid caregivers. Putting the annual cost in context, the average pre-tax income of a 75-year-old person is about $35,000. So her out-of-pocket annual health care costs alone are about 30% of her income. Next, please. These costs vary significantly across different racial and ethnic persons. The medical care and value of family care person's time is about $20,000 higher for Hispanics and Blacks than whites. Next slide, please. Costs are also significantly higher for similar persons without dementia. The total cost for persons with Alzheimer's dementia is almost four times higher than persons without dementia. These higher costs are driven by both family caregiving and long-term care costs, but also medical care costs. Persons with Alzheimer's dementia are more likely to be hospitalized and have longer stays than otherwise similar adults without dementia. Next slide, please. Although survival after dementia diagnosis is heterogeneous, we can estimate the average life expectancies and cost of care. For a 70-year-old person who will eventually acquire Alzheimer's dementia over her lifetime, she will live another 15 and a half years, about six of those with Alzheimer's dementia and two in a nursing home. Her medical and long-term care costs will be about $500,000 annually over her lifetime, and the value of family care person time is about 200,000. These combined costs are almost three times higher than an average 70-year-old person who never acquires Alzheimer's dementia over her lifetime. Next slide, please. When we combine the costs of all persons in the United States with Alzheimer's dementia, Total costs are 524 billion. To put this in context, this is about equal to the total gross domestic product of the state of Michigan, which is the 14th largest state GDP in the United States. The cost will rise to 1.6 trillion by 2050. And again, to put this in context, this is equal to the total GDP of Canada in 2019. Next slide, please. These economic costs are devastatingly high for families and likely unsustainable for the US if numbers of persons afflicted with dementia rise as projected. There are gaps in our understanding of the economic impact of dementia that we need in order to reduce costs and reduce burden. For example, we need a better understanding of where in the continuum of disease costs occur from preclinical through prodromal moderate and severe stages and to whom and variation across etiological types of dementia. We need a better understanding of drivers of healthcare costs. For example, what types of co-occurring diseases for persons living with dementia are leading to more hospitalizations and longer stays, and why? And importantly, we need understanding of the intergenerational impact of high cost of disease for families. So consider the scenario of an adult child caring for her parent with Alzheimer's disease or other dementia and bearing the income and wealth costs now. The family home may be sold to cover long-term care costs, and this adult child herself may be at higher risk for acquiring Alzheimer's dementia when she grows older. Next slide, please. 
We need a better understanding of what types of policies and programs and healthcare systems can reduce costs. Examples of questions to answer include, do persons living with dementia and enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans have better coordinated care than those in traditional Medicare? Does it lower costs? What types and for whom? Do new policies reduce costs or do they just shift costs? For example, do reimbursement incentives to reduce post-acute institutional care decrease Medicare costs but increase costs to families? Next slide, please. We have several rich data sources of population data to help us answer these questions. However, we need timely access to these data. We also need the ability to link clinical data with social, behavioral, and economic data for persons living with dementia and care partners at the population level. And we need large population representative samples for understanding the heterogeneity and to address racial and ethnic disparities in health and costs. And we need to employ rigorous methods for identifying the drivers of this heterogeneity in costs. Please advance. And please advance through the animation. Finally, we need models and tools to compare across interventions to improve health and quality of life and reduce the economic costs for persons living with dementia, care partners, and families. One such model whose development has been supported by the National Institutes on Aging is the Future Elderly Model. This model uses nationally representative data to model the health, social, economic factors associated with cognitive decline and onset of dementia and its impact on the care needs and medical costs. Models such as this and others can be used to project prevalence and costs into the future, accounting for the distribution of health among the current young and middle-aged adults, that is the future older persons. The flexibility of the modeling structure allows for comparison across interventions for persons living with dementia and their care persons, so we can compare the impacts of inter interventions and their costs. Next slide, please. By way of example, we model a hypothetical treatment innovation that doesn't cure Alzheimer's dementia, but it can delay it for five years. And we found the delay in onset would reduce the population with Alzheimer's disease in 2050 by 41% and result in $640 billion in lower cost to society. In sum, the economic costs to persons living with dementia, care persons, family, and society are high, they're growing, and they're not equal across persons. We have data and tools we need to answer some of the questions that may aid in reducing costs, while filling other knowledge gaps will require some new approaches. Thank you very much. Hello again. Thank you to our presenters. And uh, we'll now go through the theme again and then our draft gaps and opportunities. So let's review the theme on the next slide. Theme, uh, well, I guess we, <laughs> we skipped the slide with the uh, repeat of the theme and we'll go directly into the research opportunities and gaps. And I want to thank our work group members, the Summit Steering Committee, the stakeholder advisory groups, and members of the general public for contributing to the development of our draft research gaps and opportunities. Research opportunity one. Conduct research to describe the nature, trajectory, and impacts of Alzheimer's disease and related disorders on individuals, families, and society with particular attention to the needs, preferences, and strengths of individuals with and without care partners living with both common and rare forms of dementia or with complex co-occurring conditions. Next slide, please. Research opportunity two. Conduct research to assess the extent to which differences in the nature, trajectory, and impact of ADRD are mediated by heterogeneity among individuals and families with regards to disease etiology, age of onset, disease severity, familial relationships such as spouse, partner, adult child, sibling, in-law, as well as race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender identity, sexual orientation, and geography. Next slide, please. Research opportunity three. Conduct research to examine the nature, types, trajectory, and impact of implicit bias and stigma against people living with dementia, again, with or without care partners, and their care partners on their well-being. This includes understanding the lived experience of membership, of membership in more than one stigmatized group. It, for example, the intersectionality of gender, race, socioeconomic status, rurality, and immigration status that may heighten vulnerabilities and decrease personal and family agency. 
Next, thank you. Research opportunity four. Conduct research to better describe how social determinants of health, for example, education, social and economic resources, housing and transportation, healthcare and aging services infrastructure, disability policy, immigration policy, et cetera, and attributes of the neighborhood and community in which individuals live affect the well-being of both people living with dementia and care partners. Next slide. Research opportunity five. Conduct research to determine how risks to well-being, such as social isolation, marital breakdown, loneliness, financial, legal, psychological vulnerabilities, injuries, and self-neglect, et cetera, differ between and among care partners based on caregiving circumstances, such as living arrangements, competing family and work responsibilities, availability and interpersonal dynamics of family and other helpers, and social and economic resources, as well as the extent to which such differences are mediated by individual and family characteristics, along with disease etiology, symptomatology, and age of onset. Next slide. Research opportunity six. Conduct research to characterize the care settings, for example, community-based, residential care, and other settings, in which people living with dementia, whether they have a care partner or not, receive personal care services, medical, psychiatric, substance use, and recreational services. Research opportunity seven. Conduct research to describe how economic and financial burdens affect the lived experiences of persons with dementia, with and without care partners, along with their care partners, including choices about diagnosis, treatment and support services, and research participation. Next slide. Research opportunity eight. Conduct research to describe the effects of Alzheimer's disease and related disorders on financial status and financial outcomes, such as spousal or family impoverishment, reduction or loss of employment opportunities, disruption of employee benefits, including health insurance, accrual of social security benefits, and or private retirement, long-term care insurance, and eligibility for long-term services and supports for people living with dementia and their families and other care partners. And finally, research opportunity nine. Test research strategies, practices, or methods to increase recruitment and representation of heter heterogeneous samples in ADRD research with a focus on methods that increase understanding of the lived experience of groups that have heightened risk, low access to care, and disparate disease burden and stigma. Thank you so much, Ian. Our two panelists will provide us with their response to theme one gaps and opportunities. Our first panelist is Reverend Dr. Cynthia Hewling Hummel. She has a doctorate in ministry and has served in parish ministry for 15 years prior to her diagnosis of early stage Alzheimer's disease. Reverend Dr. Hewling Hummel is a fierce Alzheimer's advocate and has become a voice for those living with Alzheimer's across the globe. Our second panelist is Ms. Laura Trejo, DSW candidate and gerontologist. She is the general manager of the Los Angeles Department of Aging and serves as technical and policy advisor to the mayor and city council of Los Angeles. I'd like to also acknowledge that one panelist was not able to join us for the virtual summit. Dr. Cheney Fabius is an assistant professor at the John Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her previous work at the summit focused on long-term service, services and supports. Reverend Dr. Hewling Hummel, Cynthia, it's your turn at the mic. Thank you, Dr. Aranda, and thank you everyone for the invitation to participate in today's virtual 2020 research summit and to reflect on the first theme, the impact of dementia, for those who do not know me, I'm Cynthia Hewling Hummel of Elmira, New York, and I was diagnosed in 2011 with amnestic mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. I'm a retired Presbyterian pastor and Alzheimer's advocacy has become my new ministry. I recently completed two years on the National Council and also am currently serving on the advisory panel for the National Academy of Sciences Decadal Study. I'm in my 10th year of an Alzheimer's study, the ADNI study. And I'd like to reflect on the very first of the nine research opportunities that are noted in theme one. This one pays particular attention to the needs and the preferences and the strengths of individuals who've been diagnosed with dementia. And there are more than 5 million of us here in the United States. 
there's a terrible stigma associated with an Alzheimer's diagnosis, in which, which in turn is a barrier to obtaining a diagnosis. When people think of someone with Alzheimer's or a dementia, they often picture someone who's catatonic, who's crying out for help in a lockdown unit, and it's a grim picture to be sure. Over the past few years, many have come to confide in me about their cognitive concerns and how they would never out themselves by mentioning their memory issues or other cognitive difficulties to their family members or their primary care providers, because far too much is at stake. Fear often keeps people from seeking help early on. If and when they do seek professional help, their worst fears are often confirmed when their doctor says to them, I'm so sorry, there's really nothing more I can do for you. I'll see you again in six months. Get your house in order. Please know, I'm not suggesting that this isn't important. It most certainly is, and it is for all of us. But in the context of a dementia diagnosis, a remark such as this can sound like a death sentence. Stigma starts before a patient ever steps into a provider's office seeking answers. What if we as a society could reduce the stigma and the stereotypes associated with a dementia diagnosis? What if clinicians and providers shifted their focus from the end stages of the disease to helping us in the here and now, to connect us with the resources we need to help us live a happy life, a purposeful life, just like my life? We need research that focuses on our perspective, what we want and what we need, not just to survive, but to thrive. Don't just ask our care partners about their desires for us. Talk to us directly. Give us the dignity of weighing in on how we envision our lives. Show us positive images and connect us with people who are living well with dementia. Connect us to organizations like Dementia Action Alliance, the Alzheimer's Association, the Lewy Body Association, the Association for Frontal Temporal Disorders, and others that provide support for individuals and their families. Think about the possibilities. What if we as a society treated dementia as a disability instead of as a fatal disease? What if providers were to refer us to occupational therapists? to physical therapists, to speech therapists, to social workers, and others based on our needs and our changing needs at that. And what about the benefits of social engagements, of music and art? I believe that reimagining dementia not only has the ability to improve the quality of our lives, but it may in the long run reduce the expenses associated with a dementia diagnosis. What interventions are most effective? Let's find out. Let's look at them more closely. And let's look at more at the people who are in more than one stigmatized group and those who might have heightened vulnerabilities and decreased personal and family agency. There's much to investigate. And research, research can be a catalyst for change, which in turn can lead to different interventions leading to better outcomes. 26% of, of those of us who are living in the United States live alone. Those are people living with dementia, and I'm one of them. And we will need additional supports and we'll need additional services in order to continue to live well independently. So where are the gaps and how can they be met? You know, some agencies mandate a care partner's presence in order for us, that is persons living with dementia, to participate in programs and services. I called an agency once to sign up for a program that really looked helpful but it was for care partners only. I told them I was caring for myself, but sadly my strategy didn't work. On another occasion, I overheard a discussion about whether or not I should be allowed to stay at a dementia picnic because I didn't have a care partner to watch me. Now, mind you, I had driven more than an hour to get to this picnic. It was humiliating, and so I left. Those of us with dementia have different needs depending on the specifics of our diagnosis and such, we will have different tra trajectories. There's no one size fits all with dementia. And moreover, we need research that addresses the needs of people living with both common and rare forms of dementia and of those with complex co-occurring conditions. In closing, I wanna thank you. Thank you all for your research and your advocacy. And remember, don't talk about us without us. Thank you.
Hello? Can you hear me? My name is Laura. My name is Laura Trejo, and uh, I'm the general manager of the City of Los Angeles Department of Aging. I want to thank uh, the organizers of today's summit, our, our panelists, for their insightful comments and uh, information that they provided to us. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been in the field for over 30 years, about 20 of those years as an advocate and as a developer of services and programs for serving persons with dementia and their family caregivers. My specific area of uh, effort has been in really looking at ethnic minority populations, particularly those living in urban settings like Los Angeles. Um, I have uh, served as an advocate on the Napa panel, very proud to say, um, and then local boards of the Alzheimer's Association and many other advocacy groups. Um, today, I wanted to provide uh, comments in terms of my experience in working in this area as a partner and collaborator with our academic uh, scientists in looking at the important aspects of uh, developing the knowledge base so that we can provide the interventions and supports that our families need. Um, I think it's critical that as we look at uh, research opportunities in the future, that we have to start embedding uh, community lay leaders into all aspects of research. Uh, one of the constants that I find is that um, people with uh, cultural and linguistic expertise are relegated to advisory panels, uh, the community, the famous community advisory panel, which oftentimes means that their input is very minimal and does not necessarily influence uh, the way that the research is conducted or that it is presented. So I want uh, all of us to be mindful that incorporating lay leaders who have the cultural community expertise can be critical to ensuring that we have the information outcomes that we are seeking. I also think that it's very important to make sure that when uh, research uh, programs are funded, that uh, they are kept accountable for the target populations that they said they were going to serve. Oftentimes, I, I'm one of the people that gets a phone call uh, about five minutes before the end of the contract period. Um, you know, people are in a hurry to look for subjects for the study, um, meeting a particular target group. Uh, my recommendation is that we really need to be more intentional. And in many of the recommendations that were read just a few minutes ago, I would turn them around and say, you know what, the race and ethnicity is not one of the factors that needs to be looked at, it should be one of the primary elements of what the study is trying to look at. So uh, it's, it's really in the intentionality of how we phrase what we're trying to accomplish that becomes very critical in the outcomes. Um, too often when I'm doing lit reviews, uh, we're footnotes. Uh, we are uh, you know, an interesting uh, finding, not necessarily the intention of the study. So I want us to really start more intentionally looking at how do we fund studies that really reflect the diversity of our nation. In addition, I also want us to think about how do we support um, the social scientists that have to look, the medical scientists. Um, we need them to reflect the communities that we're trying to reflect in the research. Um, too often, um, at least in my experience again, when people are coming into communities, they have absolutely no context in understanding the lived experience of the folks they're trying to quote unquote study. So my recommendation is that we really need to have a pipeline that's very robust, that is supporting uh, ethnic minority uh, researchers, people with cultural backgrounds, linguistic expertise, so that they can then influence those research outcomes in ways that uh, will be meaningful in terms of the outcomes of, of the studies. Um, I also think it's critical um, that we begin to look at, uh, as one of the speakers uh, mentioned, at the issues of uh, health disparities and social disparities in our communities, because too often it is those uh, aspects that are significantly affecting the ability of families to be able to address the needs of their loved one, as well as for those persons experiencing the dementia and accessing the resources, as we saw from the presentation, oftentimes there is a cost burden 
that is disproportionate to lowest income ethnic minority populations. So looking at the economics and the income security issues of many of these groups, I think is critical to the study of, of dementia work. So I appreciate the opportunity uh, of being part of today's meeting and look forward to our continued partnership and collaboration in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you to both Cynthia and to Laura uh, for their uh, reflections on the research recommendations and the path forward and to Cheney as well for her contributions uh, preceding today. We have approximately 15 minutes for question and answer and I would urge members of the audience today to continue using uh, the Q&A box to submit additional questions. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, the first question that was submitted through the request for information uh, in recent days and the first question goes to Cynthia and the questioner asks uh, or says, we've heard multiple presentations on the impact of dementia. How have you been impacted? For example, financially, spiritually, physically, or socially? Thank you, Ian, and thank you to the questioner. I'd like to speak to the social impact in my life. When I was diagnosed, I had to move out of the um, church's house that I was living in and move to a new community. So it's very hard to make a new friends and, and new community when you don't remember the people that you're interacting with. It takes me eight um, interactions before I'm able to put a new face or a, a name into my brain. And so it's hard for me to remember conversations as well. And I often repeat myself. I have a difficult time understanding humor. Um, and so I often feel like I'm, I'm, I might be present physically, but I'm, I'm not interacting um, like many other people would. I have a terrible time with noise. And um, if I go to a restaurant or some gathering where it's a very noisy background, I, I'll have to wear these great big headphones. And so a lot of times I'll defer an invitation. I'll just say, um, I prefer not to go to be in a noisy restaurant. It really has impacted my social life. And because I live alone, there's a, a sense of loneliness. You know, I just um, am not able, and of course with the pandemic, that adds a whole nother layer for all of us. But I am grateful for the technology um, that allows me to communicate with people, but I'd say socially, it's had a big impact on my life. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, David Rubin, do we have a, a first live question? Uh, yes, uh, the first uh, live question, in fact, a couple questions came in uh, about why, why psychological distress would be lower in, in Black and Latinx caregivers, despite providing higher levels of care? Yes, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, and that's a wonderful question. Just a point of clarification, actually the um, studies that have been done show that, that Latinx care, family caregivers actually demonstrate higher levels of psychological distress. It's African-American caregivers who seem to show lower levels of psychological distress. And I think there are two really important points there. One is that, you know, we have tended in a lot of our research to focus on, you know, measures of, um, you know, stress and burden, um, and not as much on important sources of strength and resilience. And so it could be that there's a signal there among African American caregivers of important sources of strength and resilience that actually could really benefit all caregivers. A part of that might be religion or faith-based, an increase kind of drawing on those resources in order to deal with a very difficult situation like providing, providing care. Um, but there may be other sources of strength as well. The other possibility is that, uh, and I think Dr. Gitlin mentioned this uh, early on, is that it could have to do with the measures of, of, of stress that we're using. That the, stre the stress measures, and a lot of these are based on depressive symptoms or based on, on uh, you know, caregiving burden, and those may not be uh, the most valid ones for African-American caregivers. So I do think that we also have a lot more to, uh, to do in terms of developing measures that, that really matter and are appropriate for different populations. But uh, that's a great question. And I'll just, David, if I may, I'll just interject and invite Julie, if she'd like to, to comment, particularly on the economic stressors that we know also have a disparate impact, particularly among African Americans, but I believe also among Hispanics. Julie, are you able to comment on that or should we uh, move forward? 
Well, I guess there's a, one thing that I, I think is important to, to think about when we um, talk about the disparate impact on caregivers is, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, labor supply effects, um, wealth and income loss immediate, but there are these um, other effects that are coming through the impact on their health, um, whether it be physical or mental health, that have long-term Im implications for their, um, also their financial impacts through healthcare expenditures. Um, and I think, so I think there's a, a part of this economic impact on caregivers that um, is not usually monetized and taken into account when we think about the disparate um, effects. So the, the next question um, also relates to disparities is what is the evidence of the ability to intervene to reduce disparities in dementia incidence and prevalence? I will take that question. So thank you. That's a great question. So I think, you know, we're still at the cusp of really understanding sort of the magnitude and the size of the dis of the disparities in rates of dementia. And also very importantly, the disparity in the risk factors, because there's lots of differences in exposures to things that we know increase risk. Um, you know, to really answer this question, you would need a 30 to 40 year clinical trial, um, which isn't possible, but I think there's lots of very compelling and very promising evidence from studies where you can compare across studies, across cultures, and studies that have identified how changes in some of these risk factors are resulting in a lower incidence of dementia. So for example, higher formal education, better treatment and screening for cardio risk factors may be associated with a lower incidence. So we can certainly extrapolate that. And it's very important to extrapolate that to more diverse communities, some of which are experiencing a higher rate of these cardiovascular risk factors. Super. So another one that came up uh, uh, asking uh, if anyone would be was aware of any attempts to look at and compare caregiving and costs related to different types of dementias. That one might be best for Julie. Julie, if you're able to handle that one. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a wonderful question and um, a definitely an area with a gap. So um, one of the biggest challenges is um, getting a actual um, good uh, diagnosis of an etiological subtype of dementia in the data that also connects us to the costs of the, of the dementias. So, um, I'm glad that you asked that question because I think it does highlight an area where we have a research gap and um, we can do better with the tools that we have to put the data together to answer that question. But right now we don't have a good way of answering that question. And I'll just interject, that gives us an opportunity, I think, for some intersectionality with the AD and ADRD summits that happen in other years about their research agendas to look for better ways of doing differential diagnosis and then getting at the costs uh, through our summit's research agenda. The next question was actually uh, aimed at, uh, at Cynthia. Uh, saying, uh, imagine if all services would become eligible for you, regardless of having a caregiver, which one would you be most interested in starting? Um, for me, I'm very interested in the, um, the arts and music as a way of staying um, engaged, socially engaged and cognitively um, active. And so that's something I would um, um, be very interested in. And also, um, probably some sort of um, um, therapy um, just to make sure that I, I'm able to keep my mobility. Um, so that those would be important to me. Thank you for asking. Okay. Um, so a, another question came up about how to study um, persons living with dementia who do not access healthcare either because they are very mild in their disease or early in their disease, or they uh, don't have access or, or refuse care.
I would just jump in quickly to say, I think some people refuse care because the stigma associated with the dementia diagnosis. So many people have said to me, I will never ever bring it up because I do not want to lose my license. I do not want to lose um, my, my profession. Um, there's just too much at stake and there's not enough benefit to outweigh the risks. So um, to me, the, the, the answer to that is reducing the stigma. And I'll just and to say that suggests a follow-up to Rachel. One of our other questions we received through the RFI is uh, asking for you to comment on how often Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia remain undetected or underdiagnosed. I suppose that also means just diagnosed either not at all or much later than they ought to be. And if you could discuss the implications, particularly for research, based on that underdetection or delayed detection rate. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for that question. That's a really important important point and there are large implications for research. Um, I think um, particularly with some of the more rare dementias, I think we're actually undercounting. I think we actually might not know the true burden. Uh, we know there are large um, cultural differences in how people feel comfortable talking about these symptoms and about what's accepted as part of, quote, you know, uh, normal aging. And there are large differences, which is why the summit is so important in how families get involved and how families care. And sometimes families are doing a lot of caregiving, but they don't want their loved one to get that formal diagnosis, as was really nicely articulated by Synthony. Um, I really hope as a community and a scientific field, we can work on changing that stigma so we can get a better grasp of understanding how much this is happening and how much is it happening at younger ages. Mm -hmm. And for people to understand that, yes, you can have that diagnosis, but you are still a functioning, important person that is part of society and you can still, to some degree, you can still contribute to your family. Um, you can still contribute to your work de depending on the stage and what's, and what's happening. So I fully agree that stigma is part of this. In terms of research, we have a long way to go. And, particularly with these more rare forms and particularly with younger age onset. If, if, if I may, I could, uh, this is Laura. Laura. Laura, I was gonna ask you a question. I don't know how you're gonna answer this one, but if you can take the opportunity to speak about the El Portal program, given you were a pioneer of that program decades ago. Thank you, uh, I was gonna share uh, because that's still a very uh, contemporary finding. Uh, we found uh, in many uh, of the Latino community with Alzheimer's that we were working with, it was not an issue of stigma. 90% of them had physicians, yet less than half of our clients who were later diagnosed with Alzheimer's had no existing diagnosis, yet they were going regularly to a doctor. So healthcare access was not an issue. My concern was the training and education of the physicians to be able to detect the symptoms. And it was also not the families uh, being afraid of the diagnosis, but it was, nobody was telling them what was wrong. The most consistent frustration that I had from family caregivers were, they thought they were losing their mind because nobody would validate their request for help when they would bring their loved ones for, uh, to try to understand what was going on. And so for us, one of the drivers became to make sure that we took people to appropriate, uh, clinical environments where they, they, there was knowledge and expertise in dementia, the, uh, differential diagnosis to help those families. And consistently those people got diagnosed. The families knew what was happening. They knew they had a problem. They were not being listened to. Um, just like uh, Cynthia said, that uh, inability of our families to get attention is a critical uh, factor that we have to chip away at. Um, because that is literally affecting people's everyday life in the community and being able to cope with the, with the situation that they're dealing with. So for us, that became a driver that it was not so much about stigma, but it was really about access to appropriate clinical care. Thank hey, everybody. You. We have just about a minute left for uh, this Q&A session. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted, if I could, just to add one short comment. Um, I do think that and the El Portal uh, project is really a model of this, but there's really a need for um, more creative partnerships between community-based organizations and clinics to connect people who are not part of the healthcare system uh, with um, diagnostic services. So I think that's really an important area.
So the, the last question uh, came up from several different people with different perspectives. Uh, what do we know about uh, COVID-19 and, uh, and Alzheimer's and related dementias? Well, I'll just make one quick point. We know that it's interrupting clinical trials, both on the social science and the biomedical science side, um, in a devastating way. And that is likely to go on for a while, but fortunately, it looks like NIH will probably have the resources to try to rebuild a lot of those recruitment and retention efforts. Mm -hmm. um, with that, I'll open it up to anyone else who wants a, a final word on COVID. Uh, I just want to share that here locally, we've been particularly sensitive to people uh, experiencing homelessness and cognitive impairments, to making sure that they were being targeted to be brought in uh, to safe environments. Uh, we've been uh, placing a lot of our homeless population in, in, in a uh, program called Project Room Key, which are hotels. And we actually are trying to make sure that they're getting the follow-up care they need once they're identified to be in that program because that's been a real concern of ours, not only the high risk of being out in the street, but also the uh, added burden on that individual that they're experiencing a cognitive impairment. So that's what we're doing. Yeah, okay. and I, I also wanted to add that in our studies, we are still following our participants on the phone, collecting important information, letting our study participants know that we are there for them and doing as much over the phone and virtually as we can. So we're still moving ahead, but it's in a new normal, so. So we are gonna bring uh, uh, theme one to a close at this point. Uh, it is 316 on the East Coast, uh, 1216 on the West Coast and whatever in between. And what we're gonna do is give people a 10 minute break and we'll convene uh, at uh, three, uh, 327, uh, at uh, uh, with with theme four, so thank you very much. Uh, get up and take a bio break.
Great, so I am happy to uh, welcome everyone back um, to the summit. Um, we are transitioning from a great session around the impacts of dementia to our uh, theme four, participation of persons with dementia and their caregivers in research. Um, I am happy to pass the mic over to uh, Lori Frank, uh, who will be moderating the session. Um, before I do this, I'd like to thank all of the uh, attendees who submitted questions and comments um, throughout session one, and to invite you to pose your questions um, throughout the duration of the, of the theme. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Lori. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Lori Frank. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm very pleased to have as my co-chair, Jason Carlewish. Dr. Carlewish is not able to be with us here synchronously, and so we actually have a video from him to start us off. So uh, please go ahead with that video. Good afternoon. I'm Jason Carlowish. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and co-director of the Penn Memory Center. I regret that I'm not with you today live, but rather probably somewhere 50, 60 miles north of Albany in the Adirondacks woods, starting a vacation with sketchy, if any, internet signal. Welcome to the research summit on dementia care and welcome to theme four, participation of persons living with dementia and their caregivers in research. I want to thank David Rubin and Jennifer Wolf, co-chairs of the summit. And I want to particularly thank Chandra Keller of the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at the National Institute of Aging. And I really want to thank Laurie Frank, co-chair for theme four, who will be leading today's discussion. Thanks to our speakers, Lee Jennings, Ron Peterson, Tabasa Mahid, and our panelists, Lonnie Schicker and Andrea Elmore Bukowski. I know that the events of the last four weeks are the story of an acute, rapidly spreading viral pandemic. We who care deeply about persons with a chronic neurodegenerative disease may feel that present events sideline us, marginalize us. I disagree. America is now struggling to live with and care for persons with an incurable disease that places great demands on our society and families. All of a sudden, millions of Americans are either patients or caregivers. That is the story of COVID. It's also the story of dementia. We're right in the vanguard. America struggles to overcome words and symbols that cultivate bias and stigma and to reform systems that fail to treat all Americans equally and with dignity. That's the story of race and racism in America. It's also the story of dementia in America. We're right in the vanguard. We don't just believe, we trust in research as an activity that will produce valuable, generalizable knowledge. The goal of human subjects research is to discover valuable knowledge that will change the standard of care. The value or the importance, if you will, of that knowledge is what justifies the risks of research and the costs and efforts that we expend. Now, I said research subjects intentionally, but this sub session is about research participants. What changes to the design and conduct of research need to occur so that the persons who provide the data transform from being subjects to participants? That's the revolutionary question we have to ask and try to answer today and in the months to follow. The outcomes of this panel will begin to inform the answers to that question. We very much want your input on how language, the words we use, affects the design and conduct of studies, how it impacts recruitment and the return of results, and how nomenclature, however unintentionally, contributes to stigma. Words matter. I'm using them now. <laughs> Once upon a time, my patients were demented. Then, I turned and understood them as persons with dementia. Of late, I've turned further. They're persons living with dementia. Again, thank you, welcome, and I regret I can't be with you, but I'm there in spirit. Wonderful. 
thank you for that. And I join Jason in his thanks to the summit co-chairs, Jennifer Wolf and David Rubin, and to the NIA staff, Elena Fazio, Chandra Keller, and also Courtney Wallen and Jessica Bowton. Um, they have literally worked for years to make the summit happen and we're grateful. Jason and I have been privileged to work with the speakers and panelists you're about to hear from. Each speaker adds an important dimension to the session. There are two elements of research participation reflected in the excellent presentations you're about to hear. The first is about research involving persons living with dementia and their carers. And our first set of research gaps and opportunities that we're inviting comment on is based on the material that Dr. Lee Jennings will share with us. A key point is about the potential for individualized outcomes to enhance measurement in intervention trials. The second element is addressed by Dr. Tabasa Majid and is about involving persons living with dementia and their carers, including those providing care for them in assisted living and in skilled nursing facilities and the potential for this research engagement to improve our understanding of interventions for dementia. Between these two presentations, which each contributes so much, Dr. Ron Peterson will help us all think more carefully about the connection between language and specifically dementia nomenclature and the conduct of dementia research. All three presentations are about communication, getting information and enhancing knowledge based on what we learn from persons living with dementia and their caregivers and creating knowledge with persons living with dementia and their caregivers. I'm going to stop there because I am just as anxious as you to hear the presentations and then the remarks from our two panelists, Dr. Andrea gilmore bikowski and Dr. Lonnie Schicker. So here's our theme. It'll address participation in research and it will consider persons living with dementia and their family caregivers as research participants and as engaged research partners. Topics to be examined include the impact of activated patient communities on study design and outcomes, nomenclature, and strategies for recruitment and retention, optimizing collection of information from a range of sources, and uh, including persons living with dementia and other informants, technology-based sources, and metadata, considerations for returning genetic and biomarker information and other study data to participants, and talking about research and research results with persons living with dementia and their family caregivers. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Lee Jennings with the section of geriatric medicine at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. So Dr. Jennings, you have the floor. Thank you, Lori. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm very excited to uh, talk to you about reporters, data sources, and um, person-defined outcomes in dementia research. Um, next slide, please. I have no uh, conflicts to report. Next slide. So I wanna start um, by drawing the distinction between uh, disease-based outcomes and person-defined outcomes and highlight a couple of areas where I think person-defined outcomes really have some advantages. Um, so first, by definition, disease-based outcomes are disease-specific, where person-defined outcomes span conditions. And this is particularly relevant for persons living with dementia because they often have multiple chronic conditions. Um, and this allows care to be aligned toward you know, the, the defined outcome that matters most to the individual um, and potentially has the um, benefit of simplifying treatments. Um, Disease-based outcomes are also largely medical outcomes focused on survival, biomarkers, disease-specific symptoms, where person-defined outcomes um, are broader. They can focus on medical or non-medical outcomes, things like functional independence, social interaction. Um, Disease-based outcomes are often universally applied population health goals or quality metrics, whereas person-defined outcomes um, really focus on an individual, individually determined health goal. Um, Disease-based outcomes um, are important and they're very relevant for persons with a single chronic disease or longer life expectancy, but for persons with multiple chronic conditions, um, limited life expectancy, or a specific disabling disease, they may not capture what's most important um, and a person-defined outcome may be more relevant. Um, and disease-based outcomes can be person-centered, but by definition, person-defined outcomes are always person-centered. Um, so when thinking about person-defined outcomes, I think it's important to think about what matters most? Um, what is most important um, for persons living with dementia and their care partners to achieve um, with healthcare? Um, and so these are the results of some focus groups that we conducted as part of our research that is really part of a larger uh, body of qualitative research um, looking at what is most important to people um, living with dementia and their care partners. And what I wanna point out from this is that while there are some medical goals here, 
the majority are not related to traditional medical goals, but really are related to larger quality of life goals, um, related to function or social interaction, related to the ability to uh, get adequate services and supports. Um, I think emphasizing that care for persons living with dementia is not really solely medically based in a health system, but really reaches out into the community. And then also I think it's important to emphasize that um, there are care partner goals here that were identified. So that dementia care is really dyadic care. Of course, in order to take care of the individual living with the disease, we often need to also consider the care partner. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm so sorry, I apologize. I did not say next slide fast enough for the last one. So my comments um, a moment ago were about this slide um, with the importance of different goals. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Great. Um, so I wanna spend a moment and talk about um, PROMS or person reported outcome measures and there have been important efforts to include um, uh, these as research outcomes in, in dementia and here are some examples. Um, scales and quality of life, pain, mood symptoms, functional status, and important caregiver outcomes. I also want to echo here that many of these are really deficit um, based as opposed to strength based which I know we heard uh, mentioned earlier um, but there are some pros to these right so they're validated they're easy to administer shelf ready um, they're often good for symptoms. Um, and because they're a score, they can be um, followed longitudinally and it makes them easy to compare across studies and health systems. Next slide, please. But there are also some methodological challenges um, with PROMS. So first, they may be too generic. So for example, if you had an individual whose health goal was to improve their functional status, and that was defined as moving about their home, uh, doing transfers with less health you're not gonna find a prom that really well captures that important change for that individual. Um, and it's also important to make sure that when we are choosing proms in research that they are really relevant or high priority to persons living with dementia. And I think emphasizing um, the importance of having persons living with dementia and care partners as part of the research team so that their um, uh, voices are heard as part of the study design and outcome selection. Um, with dementia, we have an uh, expected progressive worsening of cognition, and this can have um, impacts for repeated measures, longitudinal studies, and also for consent. And there's the potential where we may um, have overrepresentation of people with early stage disease or mild cognitive impairment because it is easier for them to consent. And researchers may uh, have concerns about whether someone can give repeated measures. So making sure that we have measures that are developed for um, person living with dementia report, not just proxy report, because we also have the potential to overrepresent proxy report um, with PROMS. Um, and I think it's important to think about, when you think about proxy report, what is it that a care partner can report for another person? Um, an example might be pain versus ADL impairment. Um, an, another individual could uh, observe someone's uh, ADL function or observe someone's sleep and report on that, but it may be less uh, uh, possible for them to report on somehow how someone feels or their pain. I think it's also um, important to think about multiple care partners or a change in a care partner that may occur over a course of a study, as well as the role and relationship of a care partner. So we know there are differences in how um, uh, proxy uh, reported outcomes uh, differ between spouses versus um, adult children, for example. Um, and then uh, lastly, if you have multiple reporters, how do you handle discordance. If you had discordance in, in those outcomes, how would you manage that? And so we need additional uh, methodological um, approaches for that. Next slide, please. Um, I want to transition now to personalized or individual specific outcomes. And I want to use goal attainment scaling um, as an example of that. So goal attainment scaling has been around a long time, um, used in predominantly mental health and rehab research. Um, and it's, it's a tool, it's a research tool to make, take a personalized health outcome and make it smart, make it specific, so that it can be measured at a um, uh, time point in the future. Um, and I'm gonna use an example here from our research of a, a goal of increasing social engagement. And this individual operationalized that goal over a five point scale. So the, they identified a current state, they identified an expected level of goal attainment at the follow-up point, which was to increase activities outside the, goal, outside the home, as well as what would be better than expected, much better than expected, and then also what would be a decline, what would be less than expected. And in this way, you can take a very individualized goal and scale it out across a standardized measurement tool so that the goal remains individualized, but the measurement is standardized across a cohort. Um, it also creates a framework for care planning because this tool allows you to be very specific and thus create an action plan. How are you actually gonna move forward with helping this person achieve um, uh, their individualized goal? 
Next slide, please. So there are also advantages and challenges to this approach. Um, some advantages are that it takes an individualized health goal um, and makes it specific so that it can be measured and be used as a, as a, as a research outcome. Um, but because these goals are the outcome, um, the outcome scale is actually developed by the individual, they're personalized. Um, they're by definition meaningful to the individual. Um, this scale also allows uh, accommodation of a wide array of diverse preferences among health outcomes. And we know that dementia progresses over time and care needs may change. And so this tool also allows um, the revision of goals um, as needed. And then lastly, again, it facilitates care planning. What about challenges? So this takes time. So in our research um, in clinic, clinical care settings and uh, clinical interventions, this is, takes about 20 minutes. Uh, and it also takes training and practice of the practitioners to use it. Um, and we are still largely in a culture of disease-based care. Um, so how we, um, I think there's a larger culture issue of how we move from that disease-based care to really thinking about uh, patient-defined outcomes and patient goal-directed care. Um, and then there's um, the possibility that goals may be unrealistic. Um, and then also the possibility that this tool creates goals that are really not for the individual, but potentially for a family or, or for the clinician. Next slide, please. Um, I want to also uh, touch on novel approaches um, to outcome measurement in dementia research using technology. So we have uh, incredible advances um, in technology, uh, uh, including wearable devices that may be used to track physical function outcomes like mobility, gait, or falls, um, video tools um, that may allow observation of behavioral symptoms or sleep, um, and then these devices that we all have in our hands, smartphones or tablets, that allow measurement of outcomes in um, the home setting or in care settings that may otherwise um, uh, be challenging. But with, with all of these patient reported outcomes, um, along with other clinical outcomes or process of care outcomes or health utilization data, comes the question of how to um, analyze this. How do you triangulate all these different data sources to better understand sort of what is actually occurring? What is the optimum outcome measurement here? And, and that may also involve weighting strategies, potentially by what is most relevant to the individual or uh, a health goal that is more difficult. Um, and I think those are opportunities for um, future development. Next slide, please. So I want to end with um, some opportunities for future research. So um, first, I think there's opportunities to further develop methods to address um, self-report with declining cognition. I think it's important that we um, make sure that we capture the person living with dementia and different stages of disease. And for tools where we have um, uh, validated self-report, we want to make sure we're using those. And where we don't, we want to begin to uh, work toward developing those measures. And I think that's one area where Link AD, as an example, is, is going to uh, uh, potentially be a very important contribution. Um, we also have the opportunity to further develop individual uh, specific outcomes. And I think this helps to you know, answer the fundamental question is, does the healthcare that we deliver help people with dementia achieve what is most important to them? And if we don't allow for diversity of individual specific outcomes, we may miss the opportunity to answer that question. And I think with that goes, how do we then shift culture um, from disease-based to person-defined outcomes? And if we're including person-defined outcomes in research, and those are important research outcomes, and I, I, I know then we may be able to change care practice as well. Um, it's also important to identify measures that are responsive to change um, and that translate to clinical significance. So we want to make sure that our effect sizes um, are clinically meaningful and that they are meaningful enough to um, uh, impact clinical practice, but also payment coverage decision and policy um, so that we can have these interventions um, have wider dissemination and uptake. Um, it's also thank important you. to think about. Thank you, Dr. Dennings. Sorry, Great. we need no to problem. move on to the next topic. Thank you so much. Thank you much. Yeah, thank you very much. And now we'll hear from Dr. Ron Peterson of the Mayo Clinic. Hi, thanks, Laurie. I, I hope everyone can hit, hear me. I, I lost my internet there for a few minutes and uh, have gotten back on. But uh, thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this. And, I want to thank uh, uh, David and Jennifer as well for organizing the overall uh, summit. So my topic is uh, nomenclature and uh, my disclosures are, next slide, are, these are my commercial disclosures, nothing relevant for today except what we're discussing with regard to nomenclature is relevant for commercial entities as well. Next slide, please. Our topic of nomenclature really cuts across everything relevant uh, to the, the summit with regard to ethics, 
health disparities, perspectives of persons living with dementia and their caregivers, as well as etiology. Next slide, please. So nomenclature cannot be overstated with regard to its importance since it impacts everything. We will be talking about science and research, that is how the terms that are used by the scientists and the investigators are critically important for understanding the diseases, making the diagnoses, and ultimately developing cures for them. On the clinical care side of the house, the clinician is tasked with the charge of translating what the scientists and researchers are, are communicating with regard to the disease to the persons with dementia, their care partners, and vice versa. Clearly, persons living with dementia and their care partners, as well as public stakeholders, are very important in the entire big picture. We don't want to use terms that are pejorative, terms that are demeaning in any sense, yet we need to be uh, accurate in our descriptions. This has implications for government agencies. Clearly at NIH, how they describe these diseases, how they put out RFAs, how they design various care programs are all impacted by the terms that we use to describe these entities. Advocacy groups are critically placed to translate science, translate clinical care to the patients, to the uh, persons with the disease, as well as their caregivers. Also, as Dr. Hodes indicated earlier, this is important for communicating with the federal government, communicating with uh, Congress. He indicated that the funding for Alzheimer's disease and related disorders research has increased dramatically over the last six to eight years. That has been because the advocacy groups, the Alzheimer's Association and other groups have gone up on the hill and have discussed these disease entities with Congress and Congress has responded. Of course, we have to be concerned about the research participants. I'm not going to participate in your research study if I'm labeled as thus and so. So it's very important that they understand, the research participants understand what we're doing on the clinical side and on the research side, and it's even magnified when you start talking about underrepresented groups. A recent uh, um, focus group sponsored by the Alzheimer's Clinical Trials Consortium asked individuals about what are barriers to participating in clinical research, and clearly the terminology, the labels that we use impacted their willingness to participate. Next slide, please. Even within the field, we have problems communicating among ourselves when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, dementia, frontotemporal degeneration, frontotemporal lobar degeneration, primary progressive aphasia, dementia with Lewy bodies, Lewy body disorders, Parkinson's disease, dementia, vascular cognitive impairment, dementia, VCI, multi-infarct dementia, vascular dementia, we interchange these terms sometimes, and we often don't communicate with each other as to the appropriate labels. Next slide, please. A key factor involved in this whole nomenclature issue is separating syndrome from pathophysiology. I think that's where we've conflated some issues in the past, and that leads to conclusion. Syndrome, the clinical characteristics of the disorder we're looking at, the pathophysiology is what's causing it. What's the underlying biology? Next slide. In the past, we've gotten into all kinds of trouble using terms that are clearly inappropriate. In the psychiatric literature, there were uh, terms that were used to describe individuals at various IQ levels, idiot, imbecile, moron. Alzheimer's disease used to be pre-senile dementia. Currently, we talk about a term like preclinical Alzheimer's disease. What's that? What's preclinical mean? Well, it means somebody who has a positive amyloid status by biomarkers, but is cognitively unimpaired. So is that Alzheimer's disease or not? Next slide, please. Formerly, this is the way we looked at it. Either a person was normal or the person had dementia. But in the next slide, you'll see that what we've come to is in 1984, this key paper was published that sort of set out the criteria for Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, which 
characterized Alzheimer's disease as a clinical pathological entity. By that we meant person likely had forgetfulness, impairment in other cognitive functions, affected daily function, sounds like dementia. And now we ask what is causing the dementia. The clinician would do a bunch of rule out stuff, things like head scans, blood work, spinal taps, things like that to make sure we were dealing with a brain tumor, hydrocephalus, infection, inflammation. And if we didn't find anything, we called it probable Alzheimer's disease because we couldn't say it was definite Alzheimer's disease until the person passed away. We did an autopsy and saw plaques and tangles. Next slide. So, and, so that was 1984. The next progression of this slide, in 2011 then, with all the knowledge that had been gained regarding biomarkers, we thought perhaps we can be more specific. So let's put the clinical syndromes together with the probability that this syndrome is due to underlying Alzheimer's disease and came up with preclinical Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, likely due to Alzheimer's disease with various degrees of certainty. But even at this stage, it was still a clinical pathologic correlation. The next click. In 2018, an important paper was published as a research framework, still a research framework, that posed that Alzheimer's disease should now be characterized as a biological entity defined by plaques and tangles in the brain, amyloid and tau, irrespective of the clinical presentation. This is a major sea change for the field. Again, still a research framework, but nevertheless, it's trying to put Alzheimer's disease on a medical biologic basis, since that will facilitate research, will facilitate diagnosis and treatments. Next slide. So Alzheimer's disease then they posed as, as defined on its pathophysiology, plaques and tangles, but the syndrome, the clinical picture is not part of it. This is very confusing for most and we'll certainly have our, our work cut out for us if this becomes the uh, accepted uh, approach to Alzheimer's disease in translating this to all different stakeholders. Next slide. So the implications for re research are huge because we must be precise on the scientific level. We have to know what is the underlying pathophysiology? What are the proteins? What are they doing? What's wrong with them? How are we gonna diagnose it? How are we gonna treat it? But the clinicians are caught in the middle. They must translate this to the persons with dementia, caregivers, and vice versa as well as to the general public. The public stakeholders then are, are individuals who may be affected with these disorders. They're living with the stigma of these terms and that's going to affect their willingness to participate in research. And it becomes even more impactful when you're talking about the underrepresented groups and cultural sensitivities that may be implied by some of these terms unintentionally, but may have uh, derogatory implications. Next slide, please. Let me close by saying then that the Advisory Council on Research Care and Services of the National Plan to Address Alzheimer's Disease charged uh, a committee uh, co-chaired by Angela Taylor of LBDA and myself uh, to address this issue of nomenclature. And so we have a steering committee. We have three work groups, one on research and science, one on clinical practice, one comprised of stakeholders that we'll be meeting over the next couple of years or so to discuss all these issues, sort it out, exchange ideas and uh, sensitivities of all these issues. And we plan to present recommendations to the ADRD summit in uh, 2022, uh, hopefully in person. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Okay, next we will hear from Dr. Tabasa Majid at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Thank you so much, Lori, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's truly a pleasure to be speaking to you on the topic of engagement, or as we have named it for this presentation, putting the me in dementia research. Next slide, please. I have no disclosures at this time. Next slide. So before we can describe some of the ways in which individuals can be engaged in research, it's prudent to define the terminology that we're on the same page. Currently, I would suggest that the vast majority of research conducted in our field involves 
participation in quotes or individual participation. So for the purposes of this slide, I know we just heard about language, but I'm going to borrow the term patient from a broader lens outside of ADRD and move towards individual. When we are asking individuals, be they living with the disease in general or caregivers to participate in research, we are asking them to be a contributor with their data, as we've heard previously, or data that we ask them to produce. Thus, research is normally done to or on patients as defined broadly. And as I mentioned, this is pretty traditional both within ADRD clinical trials and other types of studies. And as my colleagues mentioned earlier this afternoon, study outcomes may or may not be relevant or meaningful to individuals, be they living with the disease or caregivers. But when we describe engagement as it's known within the US or involvement in the UK, we're shifting gears to ask individuals to shape and contribute to various aspects of the study process research with individuals. And as we move forward, I hope to illustrate concrete ways in which this is possible as food for thought and thinking about our recommendations. This is not a new concept in other fields or disease specialties. And we know from colleagues in cancer, diabetes, and mental health that it is possible to engage individuals at a variety of points in studies. Next slide, please. Now with engagement, there's a spectrum I'd like to highlight with concrete action steps that we can take to be engagement focused. And the first, as with any, is an open atmosphere to share knowledge and a thoughtful exchange, which can lead often to a consultation role with individuals uh, with dementia or their caregivers. And this might be done through focus groups, priority settings, and can then lead to working groups and health panels. However, I would posit that we have a greater opportunity in our field to move towards the right-hand side of this spectrum of collaboration and leadership from persons living with dementia and caregivers as co-investigators, members of advisory committees, or even principal investigators of studies. I've seen personally, both as a researcher and a caregiver, the tremendous impact on relevance, community relationships, and adherence, how powerful that can be as we move towards this end of the spectrum. So I'd like to continue by illustrating some examples. Next slide, please. In my past work, I led a qualitative study focused on answering where in the research process patients and caregivers across disease groups might be comfortable as collaborators in research studies. Over half of the individuals who participated in this small study were either persons living with dementia or their caregivers. And as you can see from here, all over half of them were comfortable with the later steps of the research process. So steps four through six, which are identifying um, what types of comparisons should be made, identifying the types of outcomes, and 58% also felt comfortable contributing to determining who the study subjects might be. I wanna highlight that we also focused on individuals who were not affiliated with community groups. And we heard the importance of that in theme one. And we saw experiences of those who were not normally activated or connected in some way. So this was often their first exposure to research at all. And there was still at least some willingness to engage in this dialogue or have a collaboration. Where we have an opportunity is in having individuals being more comfortable deciding what questions to ask and being able to identify where to recruit study subjects. And again, this might be a bias from the study sample that we had. But I'd like to continue by highlighting some of the differences in results that can occur when individuals are engaged versus just participating. Next slide, please. This table is from a set of mixed method studies looking at care management across different stakeholder groups, providers, caregivers, and persons living with dementia. When eliciting priorities from caregivers and others, the first step was to look at the literature, as many of us researchers do at other caregiver studies. And the themes you see identified in the top half of the table were actually lifted from those studies and validated in ours. However, when we went back and presented these concepts to caregivers and persons living with dementia through an engagement framework, we ended up adding four new care management concepts that really drove the future priorities in our quantitative surveys. And because we took the time to do this, in my opinion, these concepts highlighted parts of the lived experience that as researchers, we are not the experts in, and also focused on emotional priorities that we often don't think about when in a clinical mindset. This was also validated in a parallel study with providers, but I did not have um, the time to share that with you today. Happy to provide the reference. Next slide, please. Finally, I'd like to provide an example of how researchers may be able to adapt our study designs at each step of the process to have people with dementia and caregivers shape the study. 
In this particular music study, the contribution began when formal caregivers at a long-term care community highlighted an operational question of what kinds of music would be best to play for residents who in this case were living with complex forms of dementia. And as with any study, it started with a re-examination of new evidence-based practices in the field with an eye towards personally meaningful music, which was a concept that focused on bringing the life history and emotion of the individual together, not just in a favorite song or one that was generationally driven, highlighting the previous point that was made that non-pharmacological interventions can be very powerful even at later stages of the disease. We then examined the research environment and aligned stakeholder engagement through clinical indicators. Please click forward that were, thank you, were important family support and identification of the needs of persons living with dementia. In particular, we used a person-centered lens, please click forward, to prioritize assent during the study process at each aspect of the intervention, not just an informed consent process from a caregiver. And I'd like to posit that that is something we can take away today as a recommendation for researchers moving forward to think about assent and consent differently. We built the study design around this ascent and we had a larger sample to draw from and adjusted accordingly in the moment that might result in potential missing data. So when we approached someone living with dementia and asked for ascent, if they said no, we were prepared for that ahead of time in the study design. I would suggest that this is an adaptation that many of us can at least discuss with IR, our IRB. We happen to have one that was very open to that modification. We partnered with the Hopkins Center for Music and Medicine to adapt our design and use both observational tools and neurobehavioral rating scales that were standard in the field. And as Dr. Jennings mentioned earlier, they had some validity, but then also had person-centered measurement attached to them. Please click forward. Finally, we had our caregivers and individuals weigh in on how long and how many times per week would be the right balance of data and modification to individuals daily schedules. We were flexible with our approach and were able to conduct the study with three 15 minute observations per resident each week for six consecutive weeks. Both during and after the data collection, we continued to have our advisory group, staff, families, residents, caregivers, collaborators, and community-wide leadership communicating with us and telling us how to disseminate the results effectively during um, the dissemination process. And that process was not driven by us as PIs, but by our engagement partners and those who then needed to apply the results in the community. Please click forward. We have results that personally meaningful music increased alertness, singing, laughing, and improved the quality of family visits to the extent that it resulted in a small amount of extra funding. Please click forward from a donation to have each participant have personal access to their own playlist throughout the community. We received international recognition in the long-term care community for this applied approach, and many of these facets would not have been conducted without the partnerships and relationships that were formed through the engagement approach that I described. Next slide. I would like to close my presentation highlighting both the challenges and opportunities of engagement. As I alluded to, it's unique to incorporate caregivers or care partners in our field. And as we've heard, we need to be astute about specifying the role we were asking them to play. Are we asking them to observe, be a proxy, be an expert in their own lived experience? We need to identify appropriate study methods, define relevant outcomes. And as I mentioned earlier, we also have a challenge of bias and representation as to who is already engaged and who we continue to pull from to represent the voice we know is realistically very diverse but often don't hear. We know that there's challenges of technology as we're using it more and more during these unusual times in all of the ways described here. We also have a number of opportunities in this area, including expanding and identifying methods from other fields or novel ways of increasing engagement. I would propose that we might be overlooking potential activated patient communities later in dementia progression. We have the opportunity to optimize study design prior to and during protocol development. And finally, as was mentioned earlier, create relevant meaningful outcomes benefiting the dyadic nature of ADRD progression. I will close with the next slide on my references and thank you for your attention. I look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you very much for that. All right, before we turn to our two panelists, I'll share with you the draft research gaps and opportunities that we developed from our session. So the first slide shows the set related to data collection. There are four of them. Develop and test methods to address fluctuating and or declining cognition, including loss of insight to enhance appropriate use 
of self-report by persons living with dementia. Next. Develop and test methods to combine multiple sources of information, including clinical data, patient and informant and caregiver reported data, and technology-derived data to optimize outcomes measurement. Address multiple reporter concordance, discordance, and weighting strategies. Next. Develop and test personalized or individual-specific outcomes as endpoints in intervention trials. Next. Develop and test methods to capture well-being and health-related quality of life of persons living with dementia and those that care for them, both paid and unpaid caregivers, across all stages of disease and symptomatology. Now, this next set of three relates to nomenclature. Discover how language about aging and cognitive disorders affects the conduct of dementia studies. Understand how nomenclature influences recruitment into research and identify best practices for disclosure of research results and determine how nomenclature for AD and ADRD and caregiving contributes to stigma, both self and public, and develop and test strategies that can mitigate stigma about dementia and dementia caregiving. And then this last set of four relate to the inclusion theme. Identify methods and implementation strategies to improve representation of underserved and underincluded people in dementia care and services research, including for research to treat or prevent dementia. Identify methods to improve the validity, value, and efficiency of studies, given increased sharing of information among participants and potential participants as part of activated communities. Identify methods to increase stakeholder engagement in dementia studies across the full range of potential stakeholders, including involvement in research question generation and prioritization, review of funding applications, and dissemination of study results. And then finally, evaluate stakeholder engagement in dementia studies with attention to methods applicable across research settings. So now that we've gone through our themes, gaps and opportunities, it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to our panelists. First, I'll invite Dr. Andrea gilmore Bukowski, who is in the School of Nursing, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and also an investigator in the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, to please share her remarks. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lori. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important discussion and provide remarks on the identified gaps and opportunities for theme four. My remarks are going to center around three areas. First, uh, the gaps and opportunities related to measurement. Second, those related to nomenclature and the broad rhetorical relevance of the um, language that we use in talking about dementia for unintentionally reinforcing stigma. And lastly, uh, items related to inclusion of underrepresented populations in research. I want to start by suggesting that we really give a lot of consideration to the ways that we can extend beyond deficit-oriented measurement and endpoints in dementia-focused research. As we heard from Dr. Gitlin, uh, we really do see that dementia uh, research is predominated by deficit-oriented measurements, such as, for example, functional and cognitive losses or presence of negatively characterized symptomatology, such as behavioral symptoms. This overlooks really important opportunities that we have to acknowledge the considerable strengths, abilities, and positive psychosocial and emotional dimensions of life as it's experienced by persons living with dementia and also opportunities we have to measure and characterize that in how we set up endpoints for interventions. I really believe that it's humanistically imperative that we not allow our science to exclusively define persons with dementia as the absence of deficits or negative symptoms. Broader inclusion of positive abilities-oriented measurements also have the potential to help us extend and refocus our goals of interventions and care on not only alleviating negative events or symptoms, but also fostering positive experiences and well-being. Many of these measures may also be more sensitive endpoints for identifying important changes in some of our care-based interventions. And we need to acknowledge that there are implications uh, with the language we use in measurement for how we as a scientific community approach and hope to engage with persons living with dementia. Secondly, I wanna suggest that there's an opportunity to extend efforts to address nomenclature well beyond diagnostic terminology, encompassing terminology that describes non-cognitive symptoms, care needs and interventions. For example, descriptors of behavioral and psychological symptoms in dementia have been 
identified by advocacy groups and persons living with dementia as dehumanizing and unsupportive. Authentic partnerships with persons with dementia and their caregivers can help us identify non-stigmatizing terminology. For example, the use of responsive symptoms instead of neuropsychiatric symptoms has been endorsed by some in Canada and other countries. This can help us foster more effective communication between clinicians, caregivers, and patients. And this can also help us guide care delivery and care-based interventions. In all truth, descriptors such as agitation are not particularly helpful at the bedside or in care delivery or in helping caregivers think about the potential unmet needs or underlying causes that might contribute to certain non-cognitive symptoms and the most optimal individualized intervention that might be useful in alleviating such. It's important that we note that this language shapes how we uh, approach and think about the experience with dementia uh, on a broad scale in clinical practice. Lastly, I'd like to suggest that we move beyond uh, focusing simply on strategies and methods for fostering inclusive research, which is certainly important, but that we continue to move toward establishing an empiric evidence base that can be leveraged to inform specific actions that we can take as a scientific community to address disparities in research participation. These efforts will benefit from theoretically informed actions that consider social, political, historical, and structural forces that shape research participation, accessibility, and inclusivity. In other words, I'm proposing that we move uh, beyond equating access with inclusion and consider the broader context that shape accessibility, sense of trust, and the security that is needed to foster inclusion of underrepresented and historically marginalized populations in research in particular. The NAA has taken several steps to foster the development of the scientific foundation, but I really believe that progress in this area is gonna require all of us to do some paradigmatically uh, very different work. We are empirically informed in how we think about the measures we use, and we need to move toward being empirically informed in how we ensure that research is inclusive and that we are really centering our solutions around the concerns and needs of diverse populations. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I want to introduce Dr. Lonnie Schicker to share her remarks. She is a member of the 2020 Summit Steering Committee, a person living with dementia, and a retired registered nurse and professor of health administration. So Dr. Schicker, please take the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to make some brief comments on nomenclature, first of all. Um, I'd like to add on to some of the things that I've heard, particularly some of Dr. Peterson's comments um, and um, the other speaker's insights um, into nomenclature, which is always music to my ears. I guess that's a little shout out to Dr. Majid. Um, I cannot emphasize enough the need to be more clear and careful with terms. We must have standardized, ugh, standardized language, <laughs> I apologize. Um, we feel minimalized when um, language makes, it, um, makes us feel more stigmatized and less likely that we would be willing to participate in any kind of research um, or any kind of even discussion at times. We're reluctant to even talk to our physicians when terminology um, is used that is either beyond our understanding or humiliating to us. One of the things is types of dementia. It's not just Alzheimer's. I have Alzheimer's um, and, and the medical community I sometimes find can be a bit um, um, egocentric around this term of Alzheimer's. If it's not Alzheimer's, it doesn't seem to be as significant. But to, for people to remember that there are many other types of dementia and, um, and all of those types of dementia are important and need to be acknowledged, especially for the people who have them. Um, the descriptions of younger onset versus early onset versus age of onset, um, physicians use a lot of these um, um, kind of interchangeably and um, also the um, extended healthcare community frequently uses these um, either incorrectly or um, um, interchangeably, which makes it more confusing to the people who have this disease or um, any of these dementias. Um, the same with early, middle, and late stage. 
and our numbering of stages is confusing to the families, to the caregivers, and to the patients. Um, sometimes even physicians don't get it. I'll give you a very brief example. I went to, for my uh, annual neurocognitive testing, and the tester, um, the physician, told me when we got there that I needed to um, go down the hall and to his office on the left. And I followed that, what I felt was a, a fairly simple instruction and went to his office and sat down and he came in and laughed and said to me, you don't have Alzheimer's. And I said, excuse me. And he said, you would have never gone to the left. And I said, I speak with many people who are in the earlier stages who all would have been able to turn to the left. So even physicians don't get it sometimes, which is I find highly frustrating. Um, I always say to people, Alzheimer's is no joke. So don't use terminology about dementias and Alzheimer's that refer to it as a joke. It's not old timers disease. Um, it's not, we're not crazy, we're not demented, we're not nuts, we're not useless, and it certainly is not just a disease of the elderly. So um, that's just a few of my comments on nomenclature, and Lori, we can move forward with, um, with the um, research. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks so much for that. And actually, we would like to begin our question and answer session. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, there are many questions that we don't have uh, time to read here live due to time constraints, but all of those questions that are being submitted will be read and considered by the Summit Steering Committee. And so, uh, Dr. Schicker, I have a question for you to begin us uh, in this question and answer session. Uh, and this is a question that came in through the RFI that NIA had put out. In what way would you like to be asked to be involved in research? So what should researchers know about working with persons living with dementia? Um, well, I would have a couple of things to offer about that. Um, I've often been asked if I'm interested in a research topic. And so I think the first thing is to be clear. Um, it's very difficult for a lot of us living with a form of dementia to be abstract in our thinking. We often think very concretely, and I know at least I do. I'm a, I've gone from a very abstract thinker to a very concrete thinker. And so I need clarification. I need to know what what you mean when you ask if I'm interested in that topic. Am I interested as um, a participant? Am I, are you wanting to um, have me be um, a person that is going to be involved in the research as, as the participant, as an advisor, um, helping to develop um, the process for the research? In what capacity are you asking me if I'm interested? Um, Am I, am I going to be the person that you're studying? And if I'm going to be that, what does that involve for me? So you have to be really clear up front. It's both humiliating and um, it's very embarrassing to go into something thinking that you're there for one thing and finding out that you're there for another. Um, so you have to be on the same page. And I think that's the most important thing is making sure that you're on the same page. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, it sounds like asking for clarification about is this participation as a research participant collecting data from you versus as an engaged partner like uh, Tabasa Majid discussed. So that's exactly. Point. Okay. And uh, my next question is for Dr. Jennings. And this is uh, also one of the questions that came in uh, in advance. What are the methodological challenges that researchers face in including self-reported outcomes that matter to persons living with dementia in their studies? Uh, and I know that you had some uh, research opportunities that speak to this. Yeah. I think there are a couple. I think one I want to highlight with this question is actually something that Dr. Majid brought up, which is the concept of consent versus assent. And I think that is a confusing topic. It's not well understood by researchers. Um, it's not well understood by IRBs. And so I think another recommendation to think about with moving forward the inclusion of 
um, person defined and person reported outcomes is to make sure that we are moving forward the use of ASCENT so that people with cognitive impairment can be included in studies and not just for dementia interventions, right? But for, but, but for inclusion in research more broadly for other chronic conditions where persons with cognitive impairment are often excluded. So I think that is one methodological um, uh, challenge that I think researchers really face in the field that I wanted to highlight. Okay, terrific, thanks for that. So there have been a couple of questions that have come in around the topic of heterogeneity. Um, one question uh, related to uh, the sort of what are the constructs to consider heterogeneity and are some of these sort of artificial in terms of thinking about race? Um, there may be as many differences within a group as across groups. And a parallel question came in asking about um, the potential use of the person-centered approaches to overcoming these issues of heterogeneity. Okay, uh, Dr. Gilmore Bikoski, would you like to answer that? Sure, it sounds like a, there are some multifaceted questions there. Um, you know, heterogeneity is something that we see across clinical conditions and, and across many domains, and that includes in kind of um, you know, the experiences that somebody might have as they uh, experience changes in memory and thinking, um, but also responses that they have to that. And we know that there are no sort of subpopulation norms. So African-Americans, Latinx populations, there's uh, no norm within each of those groups. There are lots of differences across those groups and other subpopulations. So uh, does person-centered caregiving approaches offer a strategy that we should think about for how we can um, address uh, perhaps um, evidence-based guidelines for, for care? Absolutely. And I think we also need to think about the fact that, you know, heterogeneity isn't necessarily negative. Um, people have different uh, strengths and abilities and uh, resilience and preferences. And I do think that frameworks that facilitate person-directed, person-responsive caregiving approaches are, are really useful. They've also been studied. Many of them have been tested. Um, they're out there. I don't know how well they've made it into the mainstream. So I, I think that's absolutely an area where we can continue to invest uh, some effort and maybe we don't need to kind of um, pathologize or think of heterogeneity as, as a bad thing. I think it presents us great opportunities. Perfect. And Dr. Majid, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, sure, I think that we really do need to think about where we are engaging individuals and at what levels. Um, I think that there was a comment earlier about, um, maybe from Dr. Jennings and maybe from Dr. Schicker about what is being asked. I also think we need to think about where we're asking people to do things, um, where are the settings that everything is possible to engage um, persons living with dementia and their caregivers. Do we really take advantage of them all to establish the definition of heterogeneity more broadly? Okay, terrific. And, um, this next question actually is for you. This also came in uh, in advance. How do we improve engagement of persons with dementia and caregivers in research. So what are some specific challenges that researchers are likely to encounter and what are strategies you recommend to overcome them? Yes, that's a great question. I think that um, I highlighted a couple of them, but some of the ones that I didn't get to are really um, in this area of diversity. We think about socioeconomic status, we think about access to care, we think about health equity. What are the different relationships that we can really take advantage of? And what are the challenges um, to getting individuals who, as I was suggesting, are not already connected or not already activated do we know as researchers what those barriers are and do we put ourselves outside of our clinical centers to overcome them? So I think those are definitely challenges for us as individuals, as well as for persons living with dementia and their caregivers to be patient with us as we do navigate that because it is new um, as a concept for us in our field, even though other fields um, may be ahead of it, but I think we have a ways to go in that area. Okay, wonderful, thank you for that. Um, and this next question that came in in advance uh, is for you, Dr. Peterson. It's about the nomenclature initiative. It was, uh, the question was, how will it impact clinical practice and research? So specifically, in what ways could this help clinicians in their communication to patients and further directing patients and how they can communicate with their families and friends? Well, it's a promissory note at this point, but that's sort of a major goal of our endeavor. That is, I think if we can make 
these terms more understandable all across the spectrum, such that the clinician who's caught in the middle can in fact translate the science, the research to the person living with dementia, the caregiver and vice versa. I think that will be a major step forward. And part of it gets to that syndrome pathophysiology issue that comes up is dementia, the catch-all for all terms, is dementia a bad term? So I think we have a lot of work to do, but that's really a major focus of our endeavor. Okay, terrific. And Dr. Jennings, a question for you is about longitudinal studies and the role of insight, changing insight declines as well as fluctuation uh, across the course of disease. So how do researchers address that change in insight when they're uh, collecting self-report from individuals? Um, so I think, that's a, uh, I think that's hard. I think there's an ongoing gap there. Um, I think that uh, where there are tools that have been developed and validated for um, self-report, we need to make sure we're using those. An example of that would be quality of life um, AD, for example. Um, but, but there are also domains um, of important outcome measures where we don't have those tools uh, developed and validated. So that's an important gap, I think, for research moving forward. Okay, yeah. Um, so much more to be done in terms of collection of, of uh, self-report. Uh, I'm interested to hear you speak a bit about combining measures from individuals uh, living with dementia and other reporters. So uh, what is your view of the opportunities that are ahead of us in terms of combining multiple reporters or multiple sources of data? Uh, so, so you're putting me a little on the spot. So this is not an actual area of my personal expertise. So I would welcome additional panelists here to add to that. But I think it is, um, I think there's an opportunity to think about just like in a mixed methods, we have triangulation of data. So you have multiple reporters thinking about how um, you may be able to ask different outcome measures to come across uh, to uh, measure one construct in a study. And I think if you are having a study where you're looking at um, and maybe a biomarker or a health utilization outcome, making sure you're thinking about uh, individual specific outcomes or patient reported outcomes is an additional outcome measure. Um, and I think that allows you to make sure that you're going back to the concept of heterogeneity. Um, if you have individual specific outcomes, you're not assuming that every person in the a group that you're measuring, cohort that you're studying is gonna benefit in the same way, but you're allowing the opportunity for discovery of uh, individualized outcomes or different um, health outcomes that may be important to those individuals because you're allowing a tool to be used that would capture that data. Okay, really helpful, thanks. So we, we only have about um, two more minutes. I think there was one question that came in um, through the Q&A that relates um, sort of as a direct extension um, that uh, 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 relates to uh, the fact that many studies require a caregiver involvement and that this is potential, this is a challenge for people who are living with mild cognitive impairment and who can participate in that it may, that it creates stigma. Um, it also can impose burden on caregivers. This is, these are the comments, I'm just, um, that it can impose burden on caregivers and that it also has, uh, can in, uh, affect the validity of information when the person living with dementia is a better reporter. And so I guess for the panel, what, what are ways that we can overcome this um, uh, issue? Yeah, great question. Uh, Dr. Gilmore-Kowski, would you like to start? Sure. So one thing that I can share is that I believe that there are uh, new recent grants that have been funded to actually investigate this specific issue. They're not mine, um, but studies that are getting started. We do know that this is a barrier to participation. It does run to some extent along racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic lines. So there's some, uh, there may be some disproportionate consequences for who is most impacted by this. Uh, so I think that it's being, it's recognized in the field as challenging. And I think that strategies are being tested to identify ways in which um, this can be mitigated. Lori, if, if I might comment on that, I, I, I agree completely with, with what you just said about that. Um, and I think we have to be sensitive, but sometimes the information from both perspectives is incredibly important from the scientific perspective. That is, somebody who's very, very early on in a disease process, say even clinically normal, but harbors, say, some biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, maybe have a great deal of insight into his or her own situation. But as the disease progresses, that ability to look at oneself 
may become impaired. And hence, uh, another perspective uh, may, need, may be needed to actually assess how the person's doing. So it's complex in terms of the, the quality and validity of the information. But, but, but the sensitivity of asking somebody with MCI, gee, you need a caregiver. Well, you don't need a caregiver by definition. Right, yeah, so, but for longitudinal studies. I, go ahead, yeah. Dr. Majeed. Uh, sure, so I've seen also some studies to cover um, also some of what Dr. Peterson was saying may ask for a study partner in terms of terminology rather than a caregiver. And right. that may be more appealing to individuals yeah. who are early on. And taking the time to establish that relationship as a researcher with the whole family um, really lends itself to being able to better recruit, especially in areas that don't have greater access. Excellent okay. point. Perfect. All right. And uh, Jennifer, do we have time for one more question? I think that, that we are at the end of our, okay. our um, allotted time, but um, I uh, would like to thank the um, Lori, uh, you and Jason, for your work in um, convening this uh, group, and, as well as the panelists and the presenters. Um, I am going to transition now um, to uh, bringing the first virtual meeting to a close and invite um, uh, David Rubin back. Um, we uh, uh, would like to thank the entire, um, both all of the presenters and the panelists, as well as the theme leaders for today. Um, we wanted to remind the, uh, uh, the uh, audience of um, the upcoming second and third meetings, which will be held on Thursdays uh, in July, July 21st and August 13th. Uh, we also wanted to announce that um, the uh, presentation slides and video recordings from our meeting today will be posted on the Dementia Summit website within about a week or two. Um, if you'll turn to the next slide. Uh, we wanted to acknowledge that one of the um, unfortunate adjustments of moving to the virtual modality has been that we were unable to um, integrate the poster present presentations into the meeting agendas for our three virtual meetings. Um, and we want to acknowledge there was strong interest um, in a, a large number of submissions for research presentations as well as informational posters. Um, and uh, so we wanted to acknowledge that the selected lightning round poster presenters um, are listed here on the slide. Um, also, if you'll turn to the next slide, uh, the poster presentation is, um, is being held um, through a Twitter modality on August 17th and additional details uh, related to the poster uh, presentation um, will be forthcoming. And with that said, I'd like to turn it over to David to um, bring us to a close. I would just like to uh, thank uh, all the speakers uh, for having just uh, incredible presentations that were very well thought out, uh, as well as keeping on time. It's amazing how well people did with this. Uh, also the audience for participating uh, and uh, submitting uh, excellent questions. Please, please, please feel free to uh, submit additional uh, comments and questions or, or comments on the uh, gaps and opportunities. We are gonna take these very seriously as we, as we finalize these gaps and opportunities. So we look forward to, uh, to seeing everybody on the 21st and, uh, and enjoy your weekend, stay safe.